The archives are open. In its history of over 100 years, the FBI has classified many documents. Until now. Now these government secrets are open for anyone to see. Here are 50 of the most insane declassified secrets of the FBI, including details on one of America's most mysterious residents. Number 50. Alive or Dead? In the aftermath of World War II, the entire world celebrated the death of the Nazi leader Adolf Hitler. But despite the confirmation that his life had ended in a Berlin bunker, as the Allied troops marched in, rumors started to spread. Did Hitler actually escape like so many of his Nazi allies, maybe to South America? Did he shave his mustache and go undercover as an everyday suburban man, as one ill-advised sitcom imagined? The rumors persisted enough that in the months after the war, the FBI investigated evidence of his survival and the declassified documents showed, nope, he's dead. It wasn't the only FBI investigation related to the war. Number 49. The Wife J. Robert Oppenheimer, the brilliant physicist heavily responsible for the United States winning the race to the atom bomb, was largely trusted by the US government, despite some past leftist ties. But he was also married, and the FBI had some doubts about her. A trained biologist, she worked for the government at Los Alamos to help determine the body's vulnerability to radiation. The FBI was more concerned with her early life when she'd been involved with communist activist Joseph Delay Jr. and joined the Communist Party. This led to her being investigated by agents about her current ties and to her husband's clearance being reduced. But many FBI investigations during the era were much more wide-reaching. Number 48. Detention Even before President Roosevelt's infamous executive order that led to the imprisonment of the United States Japanese-American population, the government was hard at work arresting people. During the war, anyone deemed a security threat could be rounded up and detained by the government during the national state of emergency, and it centered on three groups – Japanese Americans, German Americans, and Italian Americans. All were arrested with little room for appeal, and the FBI kept an exhaustive list of the numbers. But being investigated by the FBI isn't always a negative. Number 47. The Money Man it's rare for someone to play a key role in the home front for two world wars, but Bernard Barrick wasn't an ordinary man. The stock market magnate was chairman of the War Industries Board under Woodrow Wilson and advised President Roosevelt on industry and production decades later. When anyone is that close to the president, the FBI will want to take a look at him. Did they find any red flags on the man? Given that he was later appointed to the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission by Harry Truman, it's likely a no. And in some cases, it's all about confirming what's already known. Number 46. Operation Paperclip When the US government decided to recruit former Nazis to help with the nuclear and space programs after the war, they knew they would need thorough background checks. After all, they were okay with some Nazis, but not the worst of the worst. The FBI was tasked into digging into wartime activities of these scientists and deciding if they were valuable and relatively clean enough to become Americans. Now on the FBI's websites, Americans can dig into the original reports of figures like Arthur Randolph and Werner von Braun. But sometimes the FBI was looking to prevent war before it happened. Number 45. Flying Solo While the US never went to war with the Soviet Union, paranoia was high about the communist nation infiltrating and sabotaging the Americans. That's why the FBI created Solo, an intelligence effort that spanned two decades. It's placed agents within the Communist Party of the United States to discover if they were passing information to communist nations like the Soviet Union or China. The operation was largely headed by two agents now declassified as Russian Jewish immigrants Morris and Jack Childs, whose background gave them the skills needed to infiltrate Russian communist enclaves. But not every espionage investigation is above board. Number 44. In the Bag How do you get a search warrant when the subject of the investigation is classified? Simple, you don't. During the 1940s and beyond, the FBI frequently pulled off what was called black bag operations. This was when the organization would simply break into residences or businesses under the cover of darkness and search for evidence, without ever informing the subject of the search that they were being watched. Many of these never escalated to criminal prosecution, so they weren't disclosed until the files were declassified. The tactic continued until 1966 when the Bureau ordered it stopped and it was declared unconstitutional in 1972. But not all targets of FBI investigation are as obvious. Number 43. The Lady of Peace Jane Addams was one of the most prominent early feminist reformers, a tireless advocate in the progressive era for women's suffrage and public housing. She even became the first American woman to be awarded with the Nobel Peace Prize for her role in the anti-war and anti-imperialist movement. So why is there an FBI file on the woman? How about a treason investigation? When World War I began, Adams held fast to her anti-war beliefs and she founded a women's party devoted to peace. In the 1920s, when she opposed the persecution of communist activists, the FBI started monitoring her, but came up empty on criminal charges. 
but one piece movement led to more investigations than any other. Number 42. Yippee? The Vietnam War was deeply controversial, and many anti-war activists wound up being investigated by the government. Chief among them was Abby Hoffman, whose brushes with the law would lead to what became known as the Trial of the Chicago Eight. His group, the Youth International Party, better known as the Yippies, was frequently investigated by the FBI over a period of five years. Those digging through the FBI archives will find a whopping 50-part series on the colorful figure, who wound up being portrayed by Sacha Baron Cohen in the movie The Trial of the Chicago Seven. One bloody day would come to define the Vietnam protest movement and lead to years of FBI investigation. Number 41. Blood on American Soil It started out as any other peace rally in 1970, with students at Kent State University in Ohio protesting the National Guard presence on campus as the war expanded to Cambodia. But what wasn't typical was the National Guard opening fire on the unarmed crowd, killing four students and wounding nine others. Two of the dead were bystanders, not protesters, and massive rallies around the country protested the killings. Ultimately, none of the guardsmen who fired were criminally prosecuted. But the FBI spent years investigating the shooting, and all those documents can now be read in a 22-part series. But some FBI cases are a lot less serious. Number 40. There's no place like home? Few pieces of movie memorabilia are more iconic. Dorothy's iconic ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz. That's why it was such big news when they were stolen from the Judy Garland Museum in 2005. The theft was reported to the police, but the interstate smuggling operation was soon taken over by the FBI. It took the government organization more than 10 years to track down the thief, and even then it took multiple agents on a sting operation before the rare shoes were returned back home where they belonged. But some cases might be a little silly. Number 39. Sing that song. Louie Louie. Oh no. Me gotta go. The song's probably stuck in your head now, right? Eh, we're not. But what does it actually mean? No one really knows, and neither did the FBI. When the popular song by the Kingsmen debuted in 1963, it became a sensation, and many people wondered if the song was hiding a dirty little secret. Were the words secretly pornographic? Were they hiding a coded political message? The FBI spent a full year investigating the song and its creators and came up empty, as the lyrics remain as unintelligible as they were back in 1963. It wasn't the only time the FBI got involved in music. Number 38. Not Fab Everyone loved the Beatles if their army of screaming fans was any indication. But the government wasn't as fond of the shaggy-haired British band, and the Nixon administration had a particular grudge against left-wing songwriter John Lennon. Nixon was convinced that Lennon was plotting to influence the 1972 election with his popularity, and the FBI launched an investigation that led to the Immigration and Naturalization Service starting the process of deporting Lennon. While Lennon was never banned from the country, he did back off plans for an American tour, a victory for Nixon that was later exposed by journalist John Wiener. But you might be shocked by just how many celebrities have FBI files. Number 37. Before the White House Ronald Reagan having an FBI file shouldn't be a surprise. After all, they probably like to know about the president. But he was on the agency's radar long before 1980. In 1947, when he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild, he had a file. But why would they want to know about the staunch conservative, surely the last suspect anyone would have as a communist agent? Because Reagan was such a strong anti-communist that he and his then-wife Jane Wyman worked with federal agents to turn over the name of any actors they thought might be communists. The future president was an informant. But one more beloved figure had FBI ties as well. Number 36. The Mouse's Secret Walt Disney was notorious for being a traditionalist, and the man behind Mickey Mouse and the Disney parks didn't like anything that shattered the illusion of the all-American happiness in his properties. That included people with unpopular political views, which led to his deep ties with the government. He had worked with them on World War II propaganda films, and long after the war, he was still cooperating with them, giving them information on un-American activities in Hollywood. He continued working with them through his death in 1966, and was even named a full special agent in charge contact. But many celebrities have files for less official reasons. Number 35. The Lady Sings Why would Whitney Houston have an FBI file? The late singer lived a controversial life, and it got her on the government's radar. While her troubles with drugs and money and her often chaotic relationships landed her in the tabloids, the FBI was more interested in her associates. Many people from her life tried to take advantage of her, including a stalker, who tried to blackmail her for a quarter of a million dollars. But why would one of the least controversial singers of all times be on the list? Number 34. Take Me Home? John Denver seemed like the guy next door, with his easy-listening country music songs being the type your parents sing along to on a long car ride. But the FBI saw things differently. Up until his death in a plane crash, Denver had amassed a 33-page FBI file, 
It was mostly concerned with his anti-war activism as a young man and his occasional drug use, but it also followed stalkers and death threats he picked up as a celebrity. The FBI even got involved in some notorious tabloid stories. Number 33. The Bombshell Anna Nicole Smith was famous for marrying a much older man who died not long after. She inherited most of the fortune, much to the anger of the oil tycoon's son, E. Pierce Marshall. The two were involved in a vicious court battle over the massive bank account, vicious enough for Marshall to believe Smith tried to kill him. This led to an FBI investigation that ultimately decided there wasn't enough to charge Smith. Ultimately, it was all for nothing. Marshall and Smith died within a year of each other in 2006 and 2007. But even the original bombshell was on the FBI's radar. Number 32. Government Prefers Blondes? Marilyn Monroe has been the subject of countless government conspiracies due to her mysterious death. But the FBI wasn't interested in that. They were more concerned with her love life. One of Monroe's many loves was acclaimed playwright Arthur Miller, who was believed to have communist leanings. Due to Monroe's influence, the FBI kept an eye on her, which led many to believe the government might have been involved in her death. But she wasn't the only icon to wind up in the FBI's files. Number 31. Lucy Everyone loved Lucia Ball, who along with husband Desi Arnaz created one of the most iconic sitcoms of all time. But Ball was an eccentric woman who once claimed she picked up spy chatter in her tooth fillings. The FBI was more concerned with her political leanings, as the comedy star had been affiliated with the Communist Party in the 1930s. Ball was repeatedly interviewed and denied having any ongoing communist affiliations. While she was never placed on the notorious blacklists of the 50s, her file grew to 156 pages. But some stars had a rougher road with the FBI. Number 30. Hardly Silent Charlie Chaplin was best known for the fiscal comedy and for famously opposing Hitler with his silent film The Great Dictator. But he was anything but silent off the screen. He was a political activist who was believed to be a communist sympathizer. Chaplin was a British citizen who worked a lot in the United States, and J. Edgar Hoover wanted to make that more difficult. He even famously blocked Chaplin's return to the U.S. in 1952, which led Chaplin and his wife to depart for Switzerland permanently. This next target wasn't afraid to fight back. Number 29. Turnabout is fair play Truman Capote likely expected to be investigated by the FBI. After all, the author behind Breakfast at Tiffany's was a well-known left-wing activist who supported Fidel Castro in Cuba and exposed the injustices of the U.S. justice system. But why did the colorful author have a 200-page FBI file? That might be because he made a personal enemy of J. Edgar Hoover by spreading rumors that the FBI chief was in a homosexual relationship. Sometimes it's not anything someone does, it's what the FBI thinks they can get. Number 28. Hard Rock Rock Hudson was one of the first true matinee idols, a handsome movie star who became a sensation in the 60s, but he had a secret, and the FBI was ready to take advantage. Hudson, a closeted gay man, was interviewed by the FBI, and the 34-page FBI file can be accessed online, but not all of it. The file is still heavily redacted, which has led many to wonder what the FBI wanted with Hudson, who famously became one of Hollywood's first AIDS casualties. Sports brought a surprising number of figures to the FBI's attention. Number 27. The Breakthrough Few figures in American history have become more universally loved than Jackie Robinson, the man who broke Major League Baseball's color barrier. But after his accomplishment, Robinson refused to be quiet and play ball. He became involved in the civil rights movement and supported presidential candidates from both parties. But what got him on the FBI's radar was his support of a Harlem facility for the International Workers' Order, which had supposedly had communist ties. But one sports icon was on the FBI's radar for far less savory reasons. Number 26. Shame of the Yankees George Steinbrenner was many things, including the owner of the Yankees during one of their most successful periods. But he was also a notorious crook. He made illegal donations to Nixon's re-election campaign, wound up paying a $15,000 fine, and then campaigned to be pardoned of the charges. While he eventually got his wish, his shady financial dealings led him to have an extensive FBI file from 1986 to his death in 2010. Sometimes, people get investigated before a big promotion. Number 25. The Man for the Jobs Steve Jobs is a big name to anyone who loves their Apple computer or iPad or iPhone, but he was on the government's radar as early as 1991. George H.W. Bush was considering appointing him to the Export Council, and the FBI conducted routine background checks. What they found wasn't routine, and it likely torpedoed his appointment. Not only did they find out that he experimented with LSD as a teenager and spoke positively of the drug, but many people stated that they believed Jobs was a serial liar and a manipulator. But why would the FBI investigate Helen Keller? Number 24. Silent No More 
Most people know Helen Keller as the young, deaf-blind child who was taught to communicate by vision-impaired school teacher Annie Sullivan. But as soon as Keller learned to communicate, she was determined to never be silenced again. She became involved in feminist causes, opposed President Wilson's policies, and even co-founded the American Civil Liberties Union. A proud socialist, she quickly wound up on the government's radar where she has a 45-page FBI file, something she would no doubt be proud of. But many of the FBI's files were about the infamous, not the famous. Number 23. The Big Man Few names appear in the FBI's archives more than Al Capone, the legendary Prohibition-era gangster. While Capone's most storied opponent was Agent Elliot Ness, Ness never worked for the FBI, but the Bureau was keeping tabs on him anyway. Capone was ultimately tripped up not by his smuggling and mob activities, but because he underpaid the government and was nabbed for tax evasion, something the FBI's 36 files on him no doubt caught. Even Supreme Court justices could be on the Bureau's radar. Number 22. The Good Judge Thurgood Marshall had a complex life, rising from being a civil rights activist and lawyer to becoming the first black judge on the Supreme Court. But his FBI file doesn't look the same as most activists. As an early member of the NAACP, Marshall knew that he would be spied on. That's why the savvy scholar reached out to J. Edgar Hoover in the 50s and met with the FBI leadership. By providing information to them, he helped protect the organization from accusations of being a communist front. But not all judges had such a stellar reputation. Number 21. The Bad Judge? When Abe Fortas was appointed to the Supreme Court by Lyndon Johnson in 1965, he was already a close ally of the president, maybe too close. He was plagued by rumors of obstruction of justice, and when he was going to be elevated to chief justice after only three years, the investigation picked up heat. The FBI's files showed that he had been the target of serious threats. Ultimately, his nomination for chief justice failed, and Fortas resigned from the court. And some cases are more by public demand. Number 20. Where did she go? When Amelia Earhart disappeared during her attempt to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, it was highly unlikely to be a criminal case. Everyone believed that she had encountered some mechanical or weather trouble and likely crashed, never to be seen again. But that didn't stop the iconic airwoman's 1937 disappearance from being looked into. Countless Americans wrote into the FBI asking for assistance in finding her. And while there was never an investigation, her file mostly consists of those letters. It wasn't the only disaster to get an FBI investigation. Number 19. Up in Smoke The Hindenburg Zeppelin disaster became one of the most famous air disasters of all time when the massive airship caught fire, killing 35 people. While it's now considered a tragic accident, the FBI initially investigated it for sabotage. Their case focused on one Joseph Spa, a comic acrobat who was one of the first passengers to see signs of trouble and jumped before the ship crashed, suffering only minor injuries. While Spa was seen as an anti-Nazi activist and accused of being a saboteur, the FBI didn't find any evidence of an organized plot. Another, even more famous disaster wound up on the FBI's radar. Number 18. The Challenge When Space Shuttle Challenger went up in flames, taking all the astronauts with it, the Cold War was still at its peak and the paranoia was running high. Could the Soviet Union have struck a devastating blow against the US space program? The FBI investigated with over a hundred pages of reports now declassified and much like the Hindenburg, didn't come up with any evidence of sabotage or terrorism. Sometimes the FBI gets closer to Hollywood than you might expect. Number 17. Real Life Why would the FBI have files on a noir film from 1951? Because the title was I Was a Communist for the FBI, and it followed the story of a real spy who worked for the FBI in the 1940s. The film was a patriotic thriller that portrayed the second Red Scare as a justified response to the threat of communism. But the FBI still had to investigate to make sure they were being portrayed well and no classified documents were being leaked. But not every FBI file is serious business. Number 16. Thumbs up Why would Gene Siskel, the late film critic best known for sparring with Roger Ebert on which film deserved a thumbs up, be in the FBI's files? Was someone there a really big fan of The Silence of the Lambs, which he memorably panned? Siskel's FBI file is one of the shortest, only one page, and a letter from FBI Director William Sessions congratulating him on winning the Golden Plate Award. Receiving that letter from the FBI was probably terrifying before it was opened. It wasn't the only time the FBI got involved in things that might be considered silly. Number 15. Holly Weird While Lucille Ball was investigated on her own, it isn't the only time her sitcom showed up in the FBI files. In 1977, the FBI was pulled into an elaborate copyright infringement scheme when they were tipped off by studios that someone was attempting to illegally distribute copies of famous movies and TV shows. In addition to Lucy, these included classics like The Partridge Family and The Twilight Zone, 
Not exactly high crimes, but the studios thought differently. But not every file the FBI has declassified is a case file. Number 14. So you want to be an FBI agent? If you want to wear the badge, you better start studying. The FBI doesn't just take anyone, and the best information you might get comes from the agency themselves. The legal handbook for special agents was released as part of the FBI archives, containing 137 pages of the procedures they use to track bad guys. Just don't count on it teaching you everything. The version released is almost 20 years old, at the very dawn of the digital era. And you might be surprised by who you find in the FBI's archives. Number 13. My privacy! Digging through the archives, you'll find both famous names and non-famous ones who've gotten on the FBI's radar. They can spy on just about anyone if they have cause, and most of their targets don't get charged and never find out they were investigated. That means they could have files on everyone, even you. If you're feeling paranoid all of a sudden, the good news is you can find out. A Freedom of Information Act request can unseal those things on you if they exist and aren't classified, if you're ready to see their thoughts on your browsing history. But some FBI cases are just bizarre. Look to the skies. Number 12. The First Memo Guy Hoddle was a special agent working at the Washington field office who seemed to be a competent man, which made it all the more surprising when he sent a bizarre memo in March 1950. He claimed to be relaying information from an Air Force investigator about the recovery of three flying saucers in New Mexico. Not only did he describe them in detail, but the memo claimed that the three bodies of extraterrestrials were recovered. Needless to say, no evidence of this was ever confirmed. But it wouldn't be the only investigation into UFOs by the FBI. Number 11. The Con Man Silas M. Newton was already a powerful man in the oil industry when he contacted the FBI. He claimed to have a device that could find minerals and oil in the ground and was generally regarded as a charlatan. That didn't stop him from claiming he had seen a flying saucer crash land on his territory in 1950. No evidence of it was ever found, and he later changed his story. The FBI's six-part file on him covers almost 20 years of con artist tactics, but it hasn't stopped UFO fans from using him as a source. But was the FBI really concealing the truth? Number 10. Not so majestic. It was one of the biggest bombshells in the search for UFOs. A document titled Operation Majestic 12 sent to two different FBI offices, it revealed a conspiracy dating back to the Eisenhower administration to recover and investigate alien spacecraft and conceal it from the public. The 22-page memo would have been the biggest scandal in government history if it was real. An investigation revealed it to be a forgery and it was uploaded with one additional word, bogus. But some famous UFOs were investigated. Number 9. What happened at Roswell? For over 70 years, the events in Roswell, New Mexico have fascinated the public, and while it's been exaggerated in many ways, there was a real event, and a one-page FBI memo describes it. People reported a mysterious flying disc shaped like a hexagon and suspended from a balloon. Not exactly the massive alien spacecraft, with many people thinking it resembled an odd weather balloon more than an invasion. One particularly terrifying phenomenon wound up on their radar. Number 8. Those poor cows. In the 1970s, western and prairie states found themselves dealing with a rash of animal mutilations, mainly cattle. The animals often had odd sigils carved into them and seemed like they'd been mauled by some sort of machine. At least that's what the description said. While many possible causes that weren't alien were proposed, including satanic cults, no answer to the disturbing phenomenon was ever found. It was enough to get the organization to actually start a new division. Number 7. Look to the Skies there were enough reports of strange sights in the sky that a new organization was founded, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Starting in the 1950s, it worked with the FBI to share reports of unexplained flying objects and determine possible causes. While the correspondence didn't actually result in any UFOs being discovered, the Bureau continued working with them as well as cooperating with the Air Force on a project titled Project Blue Book. But did the FBI ever crack the code of the country's most notorious location? Number 6. Let's break in! Sure, a bunch of guys on the internet thought that they could break into Area 51 and free ET, but we're no closer to figuring out exactly what's in there. Does the FBI archive help with that? Not really. Area 51 isn't under their jurisdiction and most people working there might not even know. To get some clues, you'd have to look at their rival agency, the CIA, which did actually mention Area 51 in some documents, with no details, and no hints at what might be inside. But the FBI did investigate some seriously bizarre things. Number 5. Mind Readers? Is ESP a real phenomenon? Are there actually people who can read minds and predict things before they happen? The FBI vault states that ESP is considered a perception of information about events beyond what can be learned from the senses or past to knowledge. It's a vague phenomenon, and the investigation didn't make it any clearer. They spent three years and likely a lot of money to determine there was no scientific support for ESP. 
and sometimes the FBI might be its own worst enemy. Number 4. The Rivalry The FBI handles domestic affairs and the CIA handles international affairs. You'd think that they'd make them natural allies, but it doesn't always work out that way. The two agencies can be bitter rivals and hesitant to share information. That often leads to missed opportunities for cooperation, especially in cases where international threats are plotting against the United States homeland, like what happened on 9-11. And what does the FBI say about that fateful day? Number 3. The 9-11 Files Few files were more anticipated for declassification than the first documents on the September 11, 2001 attacks. Particularly, many people were wondering if it would shed light on possible involvement by the Saudi royal family in the attacks, and other conspiracy theorists wondered if it would reveal that the US government was involved. The documents shed some light on intelligence failures but didn't implicate anyone new. Sometimes Hollywood doesn't live up to the hype. Number 2. Declassified When CBS announced a new documentary series titled The FBI Declassified in 2020, many people wondered how they could get away with it. Were they sharing government secrets? Would the FBI break down the door mid-broadcast? Turned out the answer was no on all accounts. The six-episode documentary shared profiles on some well-known cases but didn't declassify anything, which probably accounted for the low ratings. But one case might be more mysterious than any other. Number 1. Getting Hairy There is no American legend that fascinates people more than Bigfoot. Is there really a giant hairy humanoid lurking in the woods? The rumors were enough that the FBI actually investigated the legend in the 70s, combing the woods for evidence of hairs, footprints, and waste material. In 1976, they actually did find long hairs that couldn't be matched to any species. The declassified investigation was declared inconclusive, which was more than enough for true believers to say, the truth is out there. You may not know the ins and outs of these two American agencies, but there is little doubt you haven't spent a significant amount of time enthralled by their actions, whether that is through the news media, documentary film, or regular old Hollywood films. Both are, to some extent, shrouded in mystery. Both can be blamed for duplicity at times, bearing the scars of numerous scandals, and they are still currently the target of conspiracy theorists. Whatever your view, this duo are both catalysts of excitement, intrigue, and apprehension. While we can't promise you the often secret workings of the agencies, we can provide you with a few minutes of fascinating facts. In this episode of the Infographic Show, FBI vs. CIA. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. We will start with an abridged history of both agencies. The FBI, or the Federal Bureau of Investigation, was the brainchild of Attorney General Charles Bonaparte. In 1908, he and President Theodore Roosevelt agreed that the Justice Department needed a core of special agents. At the time, it had no name, and it said that the two men were not sure how to recruit agents. According to the FBI, website, Bonaparte jokingly told the president they should have men shoot at each other and whoever survives gets the job. The Bureau of Investigation was created soon after, and 34 people were hired at first to work as special agents across all of America's state borders. In 1935, it officially became known as the FBI, and prohibition became its raison d'etre. As you well know, this meant investigating mobsters we still see on the big screen today, and from 1924 to 1972, the controversial crime-busting icon known as J. Edgar Hoover was the director. Mobsters weren't Hoover's only concern, and much of the FBI's resources were spent on investigating political radicals during the Great Depression, which later included diminishing the impact of Americans with communist sympathies. The FBI's historical cases are of course too many in number to list, but some famous investigations include the stick-up robbing sweethearts Bonnie and Clyde, the white-collar crimes of the company Enron, the JFK assassination, the murder of three civil rights workers in Mississippi, Watergate, and of course, 9-11. The FBI currently has its headquarters in Washington, D.C., and there are 56 field offices in major U.S. cities, as well as more than 350 smaller offices around the country. It also has about 60 offices in other countries. It employs about 35,000 people in all, which, as well as special agents, include scientists, intelligence analysts, language specialists, and those with a considerable IT acumen. Contrary to popular belief, the FBI does not just shoo the police aside during big investigations because it has no right to. State and local officers work with the FBI. The Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, was an intelligence agency focused on national security and not domestic crimes, though the twain can sometimes overlap. The CIA's main concerns are terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, knowing what dangers or political upheavals are happening around the world, this could be called spying, and more recently, cyber intelligence. It was created on July 26, 1947, when Harry S. Truman signed off on the National Security Act. One of the main impetuses to create such an agency was the attack on Pearl Harbor. It has been involved in numerous
numerous conflicts, again too many to recount, but those include the 1953 Iranian coup d'etat, attempting to enact a military coup in Indonesia, trying to quash all kinds of pro-communist movements around the world, the Vietnam War, and controversially arming rebel forces when the USA believed it suited them. The CIA is an intelligence agency, but one that uses its brains and brawn to manipulate countries, governments, factions outside of governments in the interest of American national security. The number of people working for the CIA is not something the agency discloses, but its employees cover many areas of expertise. It's a very secret organization, but it does release millions of pages of its findings, much of that being historical, what we might call after the fact. Unlike the FBI, the CIA website states that it never monitors US citizens, although it also states it will if there is a reason to believe that an individual is involved in espionage or international terrorist activities. Many of its workers are in Washington DC, at its headquarters in Langley, Virginia, but agents are also stationed, often working undercover, all around the world. Do these two agencies work together? Well, this is also a matter of controversy, and people have written books that delineate a war between the agencies. The CIA's website states that the relationship is strong, as threats to national security come in all sorts of guises and so information can be shared. That information might relate to drug trafficking, money laundering, organized crime, and terrorism. Nonetheless, after 9-11, a congressional report stated that because intelligence was not shared responsibly, a possible counteraction did not happen. The New York Times wrote, they failed to counter the threat from Al-Qaeda, even though they had known for years that its leader, Osama bin Laden, was determined to attack the United States. So, yes and no, they work together, but it seems the relationship may be somewhat difficult at times. The CIA is focused on collecting intelligence and cannot make arrests. On the other hand, the FBI could technically investigate a CIA agent and make an arrest if that agent violated federal law. So, what do you have to do to get on one of these teams? To join the FBI, you must be between the age of 23 and 37. You need a four-year degree, three years work experience, and have a driver's license. You might also have a qualification in one of the following categories. Language, law, accounting, computer science, slash information technology, or it just says diversified. Your skills will then be prioritized, and this could come under lots of things from accounting to law enforcement to military expertise to finance. Few applicants are actually selected, and even after all that, you will have to pass a series of difficult tests. You'll have to be fairly fit and be able to sprint 300 meters, do a load of push-ups, and run for one and a half miles. After that, you've got medical checks, background checks, and polygraphs to pass. Get through that, and you could become anything from a regular FBI officer to a sniper or a behavioral analyst. You will also need to spend 20 weeks training at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. In interviews, former agents have said getting into the FBI is a long and arduous process. Not surprisingly, the CIA is pretty strict too on who it accepts, and to iterate, not all workers are covert spies. You could be doing anything from specializing in math or economics. Most of its clandestine service employees are aged between 26 and 35. Like the FBI, background and medical checks and polygraphs will be part of the interview process. Again, you'll need a university degree, know your international affairs, and if you have traveled the world and know a few languages, the CIA states that that is a bonus. The CIA says on its website that some of the skills needed are to be able to analyze data, have strong negotiation skills, discretion, diplomacy, have criminal investigative experience, and if your degree is in criminology, homeland security, or emergency management, that helps too. You'll have to undertake a 56-day criminal investigation training program and train for a further 18 months at its headquarters. If you want to get a taste of what it's like working at the CIA, you can work as an intern at any time of the year. This, no doubt, should you prove yourself useful, will get your proverbial foot in the door. It generally lasts 90 days and you won't need to take the polygraph. Which would be the best place to work? That depends on a lot of things. One important matter when working for the CIA is secrecy if you are an agent. As its website points out in bold as important, friends, family, individuals, individuals or organizations may be interested to learn that you are an applicant for or an employee of the CIA. It goes on to say that it is in your best interests not to tell anyone. It's very probable this was in bold because it alludes to what kind of life you are getting into. On the upside, for some people the life of a covert operator might be very exciting. You may know things that go against your conscience, you may see things that you never wanted to see, it just depends how deep you go. In one interview, a former CIA agent responded when asked if all the stress was worth it, I ask myself the same question every goddamn day. Was any of it worth it? The FBI won't involve the stress of remaining a kind of mystery to one's own friends 
friends and loved ones. You'll probably have much more chance of being killed on the job, as the FBI's Hall of Honor can show you. You are dealing with criminals, and that means sometimes seeing the aftermath of their destruction. In one interview, a former agent said that was not the worst part, but the fact that you could spend much of your life away from your family. You can at least tell them about what you do, though. The former agent told Business Insider, There's only a very small amount of information that an FBI agent would not be able to share with someone. We can usually talk about what we are working on or have worked on in the past. As for wages, there are many scales when working for the FBI. A new agent, according to one salary website, receives about $47,000, but a senior agent might earn more than $130,000 a year. A CIA website puts wages for special investigators anywhere from $74,000 to $137,000. Again, it really depends on what capacity you work for these agencies. December 20th, 1968, two high school students named Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday are making out in a car on a dark road nicknamed Lover's Lane. Suddenly, a man appears out of nowhere and orders the love-struck teens to get out of the vehicle. Faraday gets out first, at which point he's shot and killed. Jensen makes a run for it and is shot five times in the back. This was the work of the Zodiac, perhaps America's most mysterious killer, a maniac still in the crosshairs of law enforcement today, and a man that just spoke again after half a decade of silence. Around six months after that murder, three newspapers received a letter, each from a person who claimed he was the killer. In the letters, the person included a cryptogram that, after being cracked, seemed to reference a book about hunting. But not about animal hunting, it was about hunting humans for sport. His victims, he wrote, would become his slave in the afterlife. This is the Zodiac speaking, would become five words that etched themselves into the minds of millions of Americans after more brutal murders and bewildering letters. The killer was playing with the cops. He was needling them, trolling them, so much so that he drove some investigators nearly out of their minds. And then came the unsolvable puzzle, the Zodiac's pièce de résistance, a cipher so perplexing that not even the greatest code-breaking minds in the world could solve it, until now anyway. It's taken 51 years to finally solve the puzzle, and it's revealed a chilling message. Okay, so first you need to know a bit more about the person known as the Zodiac Killer. It's something we've covered in detail before, so we'll give you an abridged version of this rather long and very disturbing tale. Spoiler alert, the cops never caught him. Should they have? You can tell us at the end. It's possible he started this journey as a ruthless killer with those two young lovers, but it's also possible the Zodiac had actually killed before. We may never know for sure, but in a letter he once claimed to have killed as many as 37 people. The police, though, have only ever definitively linked him to the killing of five people. In all likelihood, the Zodiac's body count was way higher. And he might have carried on killing for decades. His last letter came in 1974, and then, like a ghost, he just disappeared. That letter contained a postmark saying, if I don't see this note in your paper, I'll do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of. He then wrote, me, 37, SFPD, 0. Such letters infuriated the police, especially when he wrote things such as, I like killing people because it's so much fun. For the cops, it was only a matter of time before they caught the maniac, but they were wrong, very wrong. It's certain the Zodiac murdered 22-year-old Darlene Elizabeth Farron and almost killed 19-year-old Mike Renault Majot as they sat in their car in a secluded section of Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, California. The killer pulled up behind them at one point and then drove away. When he returned, he got out of his car and shined a bright light into the couple's car. He shot Farron five times and Majot four times. She died, but he lived to tell the tale. Cops now knew they were looking for a male possibly in his late 20s, early 30s. He was about 5'8 and on the stocky side. He had brown hair and a roundish face. Majot might have gotten some details wrong, but who takes notes when you have a gun in your face? How did the police know it was the Zodiac Killer? Well, he had the gumption to call them from a payphone only a few blocks away from the station, less than an hour after the attack. He told them details about the murder only the killer could possibly know, like what weapon was used. And then he shocked the cops by saying he was also the one who killed the kids on Lover's Lane. So if it wasn't a one-off killer, it was the work of a serial killer. Since the woman was cheating on her husband, he was a suspect for a while, but it didn't take long to figure out it wasn't him. The Zodiac was real. He was far from finished. So now we need to talk about ciphers and cryptograms. A cryptogram is like a puzzle that contains encrypted symbols. It might look like gibberish, but it has a hidden meaning. To figure out that meaning, you need a kind of key to decode it called a cipher. Anyone can create one with a little bit of research, and if you're the clever sort, you can even create a cryptogram that's next to impossible to decipher. Seeing as it took 51 years to crack one of the Zodiac's puzzles, well, you say criticize him all you want for his brutality, but you can't underestimate the man's brain power. 
His first cryptogram was the 408, which is called that because that's how many total symbols are in it. It was published by the San Francisco Chronicle and two other newspapers that were each sent different parts of the puzzle, and the public was asked to solve it. A couple of teachers in California named Donald Jean and Betty June Harden did just that, and it only took them 20 hours. Strange, since the so-called experts had failed where they succeeded. There's actually a conspiracy theory that the two were the Zodiac, but that's a story for another day. So in all this cryptogram contained 54 different cipher symbols in 25 letters that are in the English alphabet. The couple worked out that they were looking at what's called a homophonic substitution cipher, which basically means you replace one letter with another, say a D for an M. It gets tricky though when one letter can be replaced by five different letters. The couple cracked it though and this is how the decoded message began. I like killing people because it's so much fun. It's more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It's even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. He then goes on about slaves in the afterlife and paradise, so despite being very clever, the Zodiac may also be suffering from mental illnesses, and he wasn't finished killing. Just over a month later, he struck again. This time, he picked on two Pacific Union College students named Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. They were enjoying a picnic at a bucolic spot next to Lake Berryessa in California's beautiful Napa Valley. The pair might have received the shock of their lives when they saw a man that looked like a vision from hell walking toward their very secluded spot. It was a man about 5 foot 11, average weight, wearing what looked like an executioner's hood. They couldn't see his eyes though due to the fact that he was wearing sunglasses over the mask's eye holes. If that wasn't frightening enough, he was also wearing what looked like a child's bib. On that bib was his now famous crossed circle symbol. The couple were absolutely petrified but didn't move since the maniac approaching them was clasping a handgun. He told them not to worry and told them a story about being a convict on the run. He subsequently told the young man to tie up his girlfriend with plastic clothesline that the supposed convict just happened to have handy. The Zodiac then tied up the man himself. What happened next is usually what only happens in horror movies featuring college students that drive out to the woods or a lake, even though they're warned not to do so by a peculiar looking gas station owner. The Zodiac started going crazy, stabbing them both in the back. He stabbed the man six times and the woman ten times. Leaving them for dead, the Zodiac walked about 500 yards to where the couple's car was parked, and there he drew his symbol on the door and wrote Vallejo. 12 20 68 7 4 69 September 27 69 6 30 by knife. That evening, the Zodiac got the Napa Police Department on the phone and told them that he really was behind the double murder at the lake. The cops later discovered he'd made that call from a Napa car wash that was just around the corner from their department. The cops got a lead from this though because they managed to get some prints from the phone. Not only that, the kids he stabbed weren't dead. They were discovered inches from death having lost a ton of blood. The girl told the cops what she'd seen, but not long after she fell into a coma and died in the hospital two days later. The man survived though and told the cops everything he knew. The police also had other clues, such as tire tracks most likely from the killer's car and his size 10.5 wing walker boot prints. Now cops knew they were looking for a true American psycho. Soon after the Zodiac struck again, this time murdering a taxi driver named Paul Stein with a bullet to the back of the head. Three days later, the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter from the Zodiac containing a piece of Stein's shirt. There was no doubt that it was the real deal. The Zodiac said in the letter that the cops could have caught him if they had been doing their job correctly. He also wrote, School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot the front tire and then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. Just over a week later, someone claiming to be the Zodiac called the Oakland Police Department. The person demanded that either one of the two big shot lawyers, F. Lee Bailey or Melvin Belly, go to a popular local talk show hosted by a man named Jim Dunbar. Belly did just that and appealed for the killer to call in. A man who said he was the Zodiac did call. He said, I need help. I'm sick. I don't want to go to the gas chamber. And he even said he'd meet with Belly, but in the end he didn't turn up. As you'll soon find out, there was likely more to that call than first meets the eye. This finally brings us to that unbreakable puzzle. Not long after that no-show with the lawyer, the Chronicle received a new communication from the Zodiac. This time, it was a cryptogram containing 340 characters, which came to be known as Cypher 340, and it proved to be too difficult for the best minds in the world to decipher at the time. People tried for decades from the USA and across the 
the world, but what the Zodiac Killer had created was something special, something so annoyingly difficult that after years of trying and failing, the puzzle was forgotten by most code crackers. Maybe it was meaningless, they thought, an assumption that put their frustrated minds at ease. But then in 2006, a global team of crack code breakers took a look at the impossible puzzle again. They knew it meant something, but finding the key was no easy task. It would end up taking them 14 years to finally decipher the code. That's dedication. The team included an American software developer named David Aranchak, a computer programmer from Belgium named Jarl van Eyke, and an Australian mathematician named Sam Blake. Their hard work finally brought the words of the Zodiac to the public. Eyke had actually developed software to break the codes, and he had created it specifically to crack the one made by the Zodiac. Blake's role in figuring out the cipher was to manipulate the symbols and see how they could be transposed, and Aranchak did the rest. The team said at times they'd get somewhere with the puzzle and they'd find a word, but then they discovered that what they discovered was a false positive, what they called a phantom. Then one day Aranchak announced, this is a big one, we have a solution for the 340 and it's real. It hadn't been easy. The team had looked at hundreds of thousands of different manipulations of the text. Then on a Thursday morning at the beginning of December 2020, a variation of the text showed up in the program. Aranchak said at first sight it looked like gibberish, but it also contained the words gas chamber and the even more Zodiac-esque phrase, hope you're trying to catch me. That was a signature Zodiac taunt. If those phrases were actually part of the correct solution to the puzzle, what the team would have to do is apply a cipher that had been used for those words to the rest of the symbols in the cryptogram. It was complicated. They realized they had to look at the puzzle and read it in a diagonal fashion, so they took the symbol in the top left-hand corner and wrote it down. So if it was an H, they'd write H. Then they'd move down one and over to the right two spaces, then they'd write down that symbol, which here is a plus sign. Then they went through the entire puzzle doing this until they'd written down every symbol. What they ended up with was a completely different looking puzzle. It still looked like nonsense, of course, but now they had something new that they could put into the code breaking software. Huh, the team was rather disappointed after that. Not only did not much of anything come up, but the terms gas chamber and hope you're trying to catch me weren't there either. It was as if they'd gone backward. But then Aranchak tried something else. He added the words they suspected were correct, gas chamber and hope you're trying to catch me, to the software as known solutions and let the program run. Presto! An English message popped up, the words of the Grandmaster Secret Code Psycho, the Zodiac himself. That wasn't me on the TV show. Was this the Zodiac telling the cops that the guy that had called in to talk to the lawyer was an imposter? Aranchak almost fell out of his chair. After 51 years, it was as if the Zodiac had risen from the grave. The team could now decrypt the first part of the puzzle, but the same method of code breaking didn't work for the other two parts. Since the first part was almost definitely correct, it didn't make sense that the other sections couldn't be solved in the same way. But then they hypothesized that the reason it didn't work was because the Zodiac had actually made a mistake when he designed the cipher. If that was the case, it was no wonder no one could crack it. You can't open a broken lock with a good key. The team took into consideration that he'd made some spelling mistakes. They corrected the mistakes and then used a slightly different system of moving down and to the right diagonally reading the symbols, and they discovered something amazing. It worked. The Zodiac really had made a mistake in his code. And here it is, the fully decrypted words of the Zodiac himself from a code that remained unbroken for over 50 years. He wrote, I hope you're having lots of fun in trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show, which brings up a point about me. I'm not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner, because I now have enough slaves to work for me, where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise. So they're afraid of death. I'm not afraid, because I know that my new life is life will be an easy one in paradise death. It was true. The man who called and spoke to Melvin Belly really was an imposter. The Zodiac had always been somewhat narcissistic in his writing. He'd always bragged about being one step ahead of the cops. He never seemed scared or repentant, like how the caller sounded. The Zodiac, perhaps suffering from a mental illness, actually believed his victims could be waiting on him hand and foot in the afterlife. It appears he didn't believe the heaven-hell dichotomy for good guys and bad guys. The team didn't waste any time in contacting the FBI to alert them that they'd cracked the puzzle. The FBI subsequently issued a statement saying it was true, and while it's exciting and a huge accomplishment to finally have cracked the code, it didn't actually get us any closer to understanding the true identity of America's most confounding serial killer. The message doesn't really help the investigation at all, which the FBI says is still ongoing. 
We continue to seek justice for the victims of these brutal crimes, wrote the agency. But that's not the end of the Zodiac story when it comes to codes. There are two more ciphers that were sent by the Zodiac that haven't yet been solved. They are both very short, and some people believe one of them could even be his name. Being short doesn't make a cipher easier, though, far from it. Because it's short, there are fewer clues for a key. The 340 cipher team has tried to crack those remaining puzzles, but suspects that because it's so short, unless new information is discovered, it's likely a hopeless task. And so, while the code is cracked, the identity of the Zodiac Killer remains a mystery. People will continue trying though, and who knows, maybe one day someone will finally solve the last of the masked maniac's mysteries and will finally learn the truth of just who the Zodiac Killer is. The FBI is the United States' premier law enforcement agency and has responsibilities that range from counterterrorism to drug interdiction and investigating financial crimes. With such a broad range of responsibilities, it's only natural that FBI agents are going to come across a wide variety of suspects, and this makes FBI interrogators some of the most skilled in the world. Today we're going to teach you some basic interrogation techniques used by the FBI and other agencies that you can use in everyday life to get to the truth of the matter, or perhaps figure out when someone is lying to you or not. First though, it's important to note that there's a difference between an interrogation and an interview. An interview is typically a fact-finding mission, while an interrogation is much more focused. In an interview, the interrogator is typically not fully aware of most of the elements of a crime, and is seeking more general information about the events that took place. Interviews are commonly undertaken with witnesses, though sometimes suspects can be interviewed as well. And based off information gleaned, an interview can later turn into a full-blown interrogation. An interrogation, on the other hand, is a quest for specific information or an attempt to gain a confession. In an interrogation, the person conducting the proceeding is typically aware of most facts of a case or an incident, and is simply seeking specific key pieces that may still be missing. An interrogation can also serve to force a suspect into admitting that they lied in a previous interview, or to encourage them to divulge facts they're reluctant to. Finally, an interrogator may be perfectly aware of all the facts of a case and simply use an interrogation to gain a confession. Despite what you think, the FBI does not endorse overly aggressive interrogations, and instead it's department policy that establishing a rapport with an individual is far more productive to fact-gathering than intimidation, misdirection, or threats. In the early 2000s, when the Abu Ghraib prison scandal broke out and the world learned that the CIA and US military had been beating prisoners to gain information, the United States Inspector General announced that the FBI had always conducted itself according to department guidelines. In fact, many FBI interrogators flat out refused to take part in interrogations that used, as the CIA and military put it, enhanced interrogation techniques and walked out of interrogations, then reported the individuals to their superiors. This integrity from the FBI is what helped bring the scandal to light and put a stop to the abuses by military and CIA personnel. So how can you better get the truth in your own life? What techniques can you learn and apply to use day to day? First, a former FBI agent and interrogator warns you that you should always be aware of as many of the facts of what you're seeking information on as possible. If a suspect believes that the interrogator is grasping at straws or not fully aware of events, then the tone of the interrogation dramatically changes. This might encourage a suspect to be deceitful or embolden them to withhold facts. So let's say that you're interrogating your coworker Kelly because your food has gone missing from the refrigerator and you suspect it was her. First, make sure you're as well informed as you can possibly be before you start your interrogation. This means gathering intelligence on Kelly. What does she typically eat? What does she like to eat? When does she typically eat? Are there witnesses that can perhaps let you know if she was at her desk or not around the time your lunch went missing? More mundane details are important as well, such as the general state of the refrigerator when the sandwich went missing, how many other people brought food, how many ordered in. Basically, the more facts you're aware of, the better. When most people are confronted in a situation where their interrogator is obviously well informed, it can act as an intimidating force, making them feel that deceitfulness will not work on you. Also, the more obviously well informed you are, the more the suspect will realize that you're willing to sit down for an extensive discussion, and that might make them feel like it would just be better to give up the goods early. You've probably seen cop shows on TV when the investigator will lay out a cunning trap for a suspect, they're sure committed a crime. Typically, the detective will lie about evidence they possess, making the suspect fear that he's about to be discovered and might as well give himself or herself up. While there are some instances where lying is allowed for police interrogators, it's not recommended that you do so. Your lie may work, but if it doesn't and the suspect realizes you're lying, it can backfire in a major way. Once you've lied to a suspect and they've realized it, they'll become convinced that they can't trust you and clam up. 
They could also assume that any plea deals or offers of amnesty are also lies, and you effectively take away any leverage you might have over them. You know Kelly took that sandwich, you can see the crumbs on the corner of her mouth and smell the chicken parmesan on her breath, but if you lie to her and tell her that you have security camera footage of the deed, she might realize you're full of it. In that case, your interrogation is over and Kelly is walking away a free woman, or a woman that doesn't owe you a sandwich since we're pretty sure sandwich theft isn't a criminal offense. Rather than trying to trick or intimidate a suspect, former FBI interrogators state that you should build a rapport with the suspect instead. If the suspect learns that they can trust you, or at least respect you, they might be more prone to sharing information they wouldn't with anyone else. Also in a criminal system, a suspect that has a good rapport with the interrogator may believe that the interrogator will later tell the prosecutor that they were helpful and thus reduce their criminal penalty. You want to slam a book down on the table, maybe toss a chair or two. It's time for good cop, bad cop, because now Kelly burped and you could practically taste the chicken parm yourself. Yet she won't admit it. She steadfastly refuses to take the blame for the missing sandwich. So rein in your anger and center yourself. Be courteous. Ask her about her typical lunch. Share some of the same interests that you have together as far as food is concerned. You'll be working to drop Kelly's guard and at the same time she'll be thinking that if you're this nice to her now, maybe you'll put in a good word with the boss when it comes time to punishing the person responsible for chicken parm theft. Now it's time to turn up the heat. It's time for the Reed Technique. Developed by a professional consultant and polygraph expert named John E. Reed, the Reed Technique is one of the most widely adopted interrogation techniques across the world. The first step is to confront the suspect with the facts, as well as the evidence against them. Tell Kelly that your sandwich went missing and that during the 15 minutes that it went missing, she was not at her desk according to her fellow co-workers. Further, let her know that you're aware of the fact that last Friday she ordered chicken parm from Grubhub. Be confident and start letting Kelly know that you know she was involved in the theft. Her stress levels will begin to rise and if she's being deceitful, you should be on the lookout for fidgeting, licking of lips, or touching of hair. These are all signs that Kelly ate your damn chicken parm and is lying to you about it. The next step is called theme development and here is where you'll weave a story about why Kelly committed the crime that she did. You'll retell the criminal act but with Kelly as the main character. You should speak to her in a soft, soothing voice, appearing non-threatening and lulling Kelly into a false sense of security. Be aware of how she reacts to your theme as you lay it out and if it becomes clear that she isn't responding at all, change the story up and try again. This will make up the bulk of your interrogation and you'll be using other techniques to reinforce this step. Kelly forgot her lunch that day so she figured, well, I'll just order something on my phone again. Then lunchtime came though and Kelly realized that she has T-Mobile as a cell provider and that means she doesn't have service anywhere, ever. Oh no, Kelly thought, what am I going to do for lunch now? That's when she went to the employee refrigerator opening it up and hoping that perhaps there was a stray cup of yogurt somewhere someone never ate. Perhaps something close to expiration date, left alone and forgotten. Nobody would miss that lonely cup of yogurt, but that's when she sought your delicious chicken parmesan on sourdough bread. Next to the refrigerator, the microwave, and down the hall an unused storage closet, the perfect place to hide and enjoy an ill-gotten chicken parmesan sandwich. Kelly could practically taste the melting cheese. It was either this or eat nothing at all and her stomach was rumbling. She's not a bad person, she just had a small breakfast is all. See what we did there? We created a theme that was sympathetic to Kelly's plight, recreated events from a point of view that didn't treat Kelly like the dirty rotten criminal that she actually is. We excused her for the theft, appealed to her sense of helplessness in the situation, let her believe that we understood and were sympathetic to the theft. Throughout your building of the theme though, you'll have to stop Kelly's denials on the spot. Once a suspect is allowed to voice a denial, it increases their confidence. Every time Kelly tries to object and voice a denial, simply cut her off and let her know that it'll be her turn to talk in a minute. Don't let her start to voice denials or she'll become emboldened and immune to your tactics. Be polite but very firm. Next, you'll have to be ready to overcome objections, which differ from denials. Denials are basically just a brief, I didn't do it statement. Objections, however, offer logic-based reasons for why the suspect simply couldn't have committed the crime. Kelly might say, I could never have stolen your sandwich. My father died of starvation because someone stole his sandwich. It's your job to use the information she gives you and turn it around on her. You can, for instance, reply with, I understand that you could never plan to do something so awful after what happened to your father. It was just a one-time mistake. You were hungry and out of control. I understand. You should turn objections into admissions of guilt. 
At this point, Kelly is frustrated. She's literally marinating in her own guilt. It's your job to vent some of that pressure and earn more for trust. This whole time, you should have been either across the table from Kelly or walking around the room, towering over her. That makes her feel smaller and vulnerable. But now you're going to sit down on her side of the table, lower yourself to her level and draw close, put a hand on her shoulder, offer physical gestures of concern. Now it's time to get your confession. It's time to build alternatives. At this stage, you offer two different motives for the crime. One should be more reasonable so as to nudge the suspect along, while the other should be more morally repugnant. This will help the suspect agree to the more reasonable motivation and lead to confession. It doesn't matter if this motivation is real or not. All that matters is the almighty confession. Tell Kelly that perhaps she stole the sandwich because she just couldn't resist the temptation. Heck, you couldn't resist the temptation of that Snickers bar you ate last night even though you're supposed to be dieting. This motive is understandable, it's relatable, it's something that a rational, reasonable person could excuse. It's just a mistake, that's all. Then tell Kelly that perhaps she stole the sandwich because it was her that stole her father's sandwich which led to his death by starvation. Perhaps Kelly loves to starve people to death, one sandwich at a time, and she thought that she could get away with it again today. This motive is outrageous and morally repugnant, likely causing Kelly to object loudly to it. That's good. That's what you want her to do, because you're going to backtrack and lead her down the road of the first motive. I know, you're not a sandwich killer, Kelly. I've known you for months now. You seem like such a nice person. You were just hungry. It was a mistake, I understand. At this point, Kelly's probably in tears, and more than ready to confess. Congratulations, because you've just used FBI interrogation techniques to get your coworker to confess to stealing your sandwich. And it's a good thing that you have a solid grasp on these techniques, because everything you just did to your coworker is basically one giant super fireable offense, and you're going to need a new job after you get canned. You've got your story straight. You've spent months prepping to go undercover and infiltrate the Italian American Mafia. You are no longer named Joseph Pistone, and from now on you'll only answer to a name the crew calls you. You've got a fake driver's license that bears that name, and you've got swagger befitting a gangster. You know how to use that Mafia twang and say, how you doing, and forget about it in just the right way. You're going to try and fool some of the most dangerous criminals in the world and bring them down. That will mean seeing some disturbing things, and as you move through this new life, every day could be your last. This is the story of one of the biggest lies the FBI ever told, the story of a man who was once known as Donnie Brasco. Joseph Joe Pistone was the right fit for an undercover cop who would infiltrate an Italian-American crime family. He was part Sicilian, grew up in New Jersey where the Mafia presence was strong, and so he had the background and knew the patois of those gangsters. He looked the part, sounded the part, and when the time came, he was ready to be a wise guy. In fact, a much wiser guy than the wise guys he worked with. His early life didn't consist of petty crime and fighting in the mean streets of New Jersey. He studied hard, attained a degree in anthropology, and later went to work for naval intelligence. It wasn't until 1969, when he was 30 years old, that he started working for the FBI. Five years later, he was moving to New York when he joined the truck hijacking unit, with hijacking trucks being a big money spinner for the Mafia. Sometimes the truck drivers were in on it too, and took payment and maybe a black eye for a payoff. Hundreds of trucks were getting done over and millions of dollars of items were being stolen. It didn't really matter what the bounty was, it could all be sold on. In 1974, when Pistone joined that unit, the truck hijacking business was bringing in $4.2 million a year. Something had to be done. But it wasn't the truck hijacking that made Pistone a well-regarded name in the FBI. It was when he went undercover for the first time and brought down a vehicle theft ring. 30 people were arrested and the FBI knew they had a man they could use. It was 1976 when Pistone put his hand up and said he was willing to go undercover again, but this time the assignment was about as dangerous as could be. He said he'd infiltrate one of the five families that ran New York City's criminal underworld. That was the Bonanno crime family. He spoke Italian fluently, including the street slang of the gangsters. He'd grown up among them and had a Sicilian heritage, and as he proved, he could work well undercover. There wasn't really a better man for the job. He just needed to create a backstory, and that meant everything, from fictional fights he had in high school and how much he loved his grandmother's pasta con la sarde and mouth-watering casata siciliana. He had the no names in the mafia and how the organization worked. He had made up past loves, 
he had been kicked around the tough streets, and that's how he got into crime. His principal income was jewel thievery, and if you're a jewel thief, you have to know a thing or two about jewels. This was a tricky part of the backstory, and Pistoni had to spend some time studying gemology. He passed with bright flying colors. His name was erased. He was expunged from history. There was no Joe Pistoni now, only Donnie Brasco, the jewel thief. It was intended that he'd stay this way for six months, but as you'll see, things didn't quite work out that way. One day, this man named Donnie turned up in Little Italy. He frequented restaurants and hung out in bars. He always seemed to have a lot of cash on him, and while he didn't immediately tell the folks he met why this was, he did get particularly friendly with a barman at one place. Then he let it be known that he had jewels and he knew where he could get more jewels. He was useful to any criminal empire. With all the cash he had, he was obviously pretty good at his job. You have to think about how dangerous this was. It wasn't as if he was working in Alaska. He could have easily been spotted by someone he knew, and if met on the street and called Joe, he was done for. To prevent anyone from letting the story out, only a few people in the FBI knew about the operation, while his co-workers just thought he'd moved on someplace. His own friends didn't know where he'd gone. The man was a ghost. He couldn't be seen to be big time, otherwise someone would have already heard of him. But the act was that while he was small time, he could certainly get involved with bigger things and likely earn for a family. It actually took about six months before he got a break and was introduced to someone from the Colombo crime family. There he started working for Jilly Greca and his crew, an outfit that got most of their money from stealing and hijacking. This wasn't really the higher echelons of mafia crews, but it was a start. The funny thing is, because he was so undercover, the New York cops soon had a file on him. That file said he was a crook and a new addition to the Greca crew, named Don Brasco. Then he got another break and met a man with a violent temper and a will to kill. That man was Anthony Tony Mira, and he was part of the Bonanno crime family. Now things got serious because Tony was known for his temper. It's thought he killed 30 to 40 people during his criminal career. Brasco worked more closely with other members of the family, including Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano and Benjamin Lefty Guns Ruggiero. He developed a close friendship with the latter, and this is how the many exploits of the mafia got back to the FBI. During this time, life was filled with patches of boredom and loneliness. Months and years passed and he had no real friends or anyone to love or confide in. It was a dangerous job, but one of the worst aspects of working undercover was basically not being able to be you and enjoy unadulterated emotions. When it came to the more dangerous side of this life, Brasco was never involved in things like big shootouts and he never had to whack a guy. He just played a part, stayed in character, and listened. Of course, he had to witness violence though. Unlike some undercover agents that would follow, Brasco never lost sight of who he was. While he acted well, he was always aware that he was an FBI agent and his friendships were not real. He might laugh and joke around with them and the laughter wasn't fake, but he also knew that one bad move would mean those guys laughing with him would fix him a pair of cement boots and send him for a swim in the Hudson. He also had a wife and kids who depended on him. They knew nothing about what he was doing and he only got to see them once every few months. At one point, he had a car trunk filled with Christmas gifts and was about to go home to his family, but then he bumped into some of his crew and they took him out on a wild night. He had to play the part. The guys in this crew thought Donnie was a bachelor and would be spending Christmas alone in his room. They sympathized with the man. They even visited him at his room and brought a surprise Christmas tree, after which they helped him decorate it. What are you going to do? It's Christmas time. Bada bing, bada boom. There was even one time when Brasco's wife had a near-fatal car accident and he had to go missing for several days. Upon returning, he couldn't show sadness and had to make up a story as to where he'd been. One of the scariest aspects of the job as time went by was when he was summoned to a mob meeting. Every single time he showed up, he wondered if his real identity had been exposed and he would get whacked there and then. On another occasion, he and Lefty were blamed for messing up a job and he could have been taken out for that, but instead they let him off. Brasco ended up in Florida, where he ran quite a successful operation. At this point, the ill-tempered Mira had just gotten out of jail and discovered that Brasco was making a lot of cash. He demanded part of that, seeing as it was him that gave him his start. This was also a troublesome time when lives were on the line. But when he was alone with Sonny or Lefty, much of the time they just lived like normal friends. They didn't always talk about mafia stuff. You have to remember, this went on for years and years. And while movies or TV might depict Brasco's life as being crime 24 hours a day, it just wasn't like that. Most of the time was spent sitting at home watching TV or going to the bar and playing cards. 
Brasco didn't know too much about the inner workings of the crime family because he wasn't a made man. You know what you need to know is how the mafia dealt with things. They knew very well that in New York City you are never more than a few feet away from a rat. From time to time things slipped though, and a big break for Brasco is when Sonny told him about three captains that had been whacked. They had been told to come to a meeting, and when they got there they were shot by Lefty and other men. Sonny was now confiding in Brasco, which was good and bad. The downside to becoming a closer member of the family was doing what family members did, and that was dealing in violence and sometimes murder. Sonny said to Brasco, I need you to take out a person, but you know what? I'm going to try and make you a made man. You'll be one of us. We're going to make some serious money. He was now in too deep for his own good. One, because killing someone was too extreme an act to follow, and two, because now he was so close to Sonny, he was a target for the people he was supposedly warring against. He might get taken out both as a wise guy and in the line of duty. It was too much. The FBI pulled him out. The aftermath was, to say the least, chaotic. And at first, Brasco's old crew didn't believe the truth. They thought this was some kind of wicked lie, a trap laid by the FBI. They soon discovered it wasn't a lie, and Donnie Brasco, their friend and associate, had never existed. Sonny was soon murdered for getting too close to Brasco and not unearthing the truth. Lefty ended up in prison. Mira went into hiding. But things weren't looking too good because the Bonanno family boss, one Joseph Massino, had ordered his murder. A mafia soldier named Joseph D'Amico did the business in the end, shooting him a few times in the head. Ironically, D'Amico would also later become an informant. As for what happened during the job, his friendships made. Pistone once said, I had no sense of guilt. All during the course of the operation, I knew it was a job. He did later say, though, that he didn't want his old comrades to be killed. He only wanted them imprisoned. The Mafia put a $500,000 contract out in Pistone's life, and to counter what some people believe, he says it's never been rescinded. He and his family live with false names which they change occasionally. No one knows where they are, and they certainly stay away from locations where there is a Mafia presence. Time might have passed, but Pistone believes there will be some big shot out there who wants to say he was the man who took down the FBI's most famous undercover cop. You finally picked up the courage to visit the dark web and you took every necessary precaution to stay invisible to the authorities. At first, you were only going to look around and not actually purchase anything, but after a few of your buddies came around to your house, you all decided you'd buy a big bag of illegal pills. Not only that, after a few drinks, you watched a video you shouldn't have watched. You weren't concerned, you used a VPN, your IP address couldn't be seen by prying eyes, and then, boom, one day the cops burst through your door. How on earth did that happen? How did they find you? That's what we'll discuss today. Number 5. Hacking First of all, you should know that a lot of people use the dark web for good reasons. Maybe they are journalists or political dissidents in countries with strict regimes, so some human rights advocates are happy that the authorities can't find people in the dark web. That's why it was controversial when a cybercriminal named Eric Owen Marquez was arrested in 2013 and later got a prison sentence of 30 years. This guy was certainly in the wrong and was hosting websites within the dark that were selling drugs, hacking techniques, and money laundering operations. He was huge, and it's thought his cloud computing company Freedom Hosting was hosting almost half of the sketchy websites within the dark web. The FBI got him. They found his server in France and subsequently tracked him down to Ireland. This shouldn't have happened, of course. The Tor network this guy used was supposed to be impenetrable. But then, one day, users started seeing something weird. A new code running in websites hosted by Freedom Hosting. Suddenly, all the websites went down. That weird code exploited a Firefox vulnerability and so not only did the websites go down, but people using those websites were unmasked. Well, they were until they could update their software. Tens of thousands of IP addresses were exposed and some of those people that were exposed were arrested. That could have been you and you might have been seen buying bags of Columbia's finest powder. But private email systems were also run on Freedom Hosting, so journalists or freedom fighters may have also been exposed. So that's one way you could be found out using the dark web. The government might get its crack team of hackers together and create a code that exploits a vulnerability in some software. It might not mean they've come knocking at your door, but your name will certainly be saved in the FBI's database. You've been flagged. Thousands of people around the world have been arrested this way. In the US, the FBI won't say how it hacks its way into the dark web, while in other countries, governments also keep their surveillance under wraps. In the UK, the government gives its intelligence agencies something called bulk powers, which allows them to spy on people. The thing is, the agencies don't have to submit any information to the court as to exactly how they got you. That remains a secret. If you're worried about being hacked by the government, though, wait until you hear how they can get you without hacking you at all. Number 4. Cops Go Undercover 
Sometimes the government doesn't really have to get technical. The authorities can use techniques that they use on the streets. Cops can go undercover. Let's say you're on the dark web and you find a place where you can get the illegal substance MDMA. All the reviews are positive regarding the seller, so you think, ok, I'll take 500 pills because you're in college and you want to pay your tuition fees off. Well, you might just be buying your pills from a cop who's been undercover posing as Rick the Raver, the merchant of Molly. Time and again, cops have done this with drugs, guns, poisons, and images of children. You see, you buy the stuff and you remain anonymous. But you still have to get your contraband delivered, and that's when the cops can grab you. There are ethical concerns though, the cops can't oversell their stuff, they can't say, hey, take these 500 pills, but I've got some great cocaine too, do you want that? That's called entrapment. They can't say, take a thousand pills and I'll throw in a gun, that's just not ethical. Then you've got these images of kids that float around the dark web. There's been a lot of controversy regarding the FBI putting out their own images and setting up what's called a honeypot. The problem is, once those images are out, they can be copied and spread all over the web. But you can avoid in-person delivery and avoid an undercover agent, right? Well, if you think other means of scoring your gear are safe, stay tuned. Number 3. The Postal Service You don't have to be set up to have the cops knocking at your door. A huge amount of contraband is seized before it even gets to the buyer. The post office can intercept a package, find a few ounces of cocaine, and then they can get in touch with the police. The police can then start an investigation, and while the buyer might not get arrested because the package never arrived, the cops in the past have watched post office videos and have been able to arrest the sender of the package or packages. In other cases, they weren't able to find the seller, so police allowed the post office to deliver the package in what they called a controlled delivery. As soon as you pick it up, they swoop in on you. It's unlikely police will ever get involved if someone is buying, say, one single pill of something. But if the package is big enough, there's always a risk. Sometimes, though, you could get busted and it's not even your fault. Number 2. A Dealer's Data one outstanding case of someone being caught selling drugs on the dark web was a kid in Germany who was arrested by police in 2015. This 20-year-old guy, who still lived with his mom, was found with a whopping 320 kilograms of drugs in his bedroom. Yeah, you heard that right. He pretty much ran a drug empire from his bedroom and sold drugs from the dark web to people in Germany and in other countries all over the world. He would usually use a P.O. box, not a house or an apartment number, and the person who picked the package was never the person's name on the package. If the person was ever caught picking up the drugs, he or she would say, hey, that's not my name. The thing is, the kid still needed to pick up the drugs. 320 kilos is quite a bit of powder and pills, and it was when he was picking up one of his packages that the cops got him. But guess what? When the cops looked on this kid's hard drive, they found all the names and emails of all the people he'd been selling to. That included guys just buying for personal use, which was not much use to the cops, but it also included bulk buyers who were selling on the streets of Germany and beyond. Someone on the dark web managed to get this kid's profile and leave a message. That message read, dealers run for your lives. That's the thing with the dark web. If someone else gets caught, your information might be on their computer. That kid became a millionaire very fast, but now he's in prison and will be for possibly another decade. The problem is, no sooner than the kid was behind bars, someone else had taken over his dark web domain. Sometimes though, you can get busted without even visiting the dark web. Number 1. Advertising the last way people are caught is when they advertise their dark web marketplace on the very visible normal web that we all use. Yeah, they use the normal web to direct people to the dark web. It's just a little silly, but Ross Ulbricht, the guy that ran the notorious Silk Road marketplace, did just that. He ran ads on a Bitcoin web forum for the Silk Road, and those ads could be traced back to him. For such a smart guy, he definitely missed several big brain moments. Despite their crimes, many men and women with symmetrical faces and without distinguishing characteristics never make the FBI's most wanted. They must have marks, scars, tattoos, or stand out in some other way in order to make the cut. Otherwise, they won't be identified. Fortunately, quite a few murderers have something other than their twisted minds to set them apart. From bludgeoning, shooting, biting, and burning victims, these are the worst from the FBI's list. Let's see what exactly they did in this episode of the Infographics Show. Most Violent of the FBI's Most Wanted Criminals Number 10 is Joe Sanz Some criminals enjoy taking the lives of others, particularly when it comes to mass murderers and serial killers. However, Joe Sanz of the Quattro Flats gang earned the nickname Smiley for a quite disturbing reason. He had a tendency to be downright jolly when killing people. He was caught on camera happily smiling and greeting others as he walked toward the front of a house. The man there owed Sands money, and he rubbed his hands together eagerly. Sands then pulled out a gun, shot the man again and again, and continued on nonchalantly. 
Those who viewed the footage likely had to rewind to be sure of what had even happened. Unsurprisingly, it was not the first crime he was known for. A decade earlier, he walked up the two rival gang members, shot them multiple times at point-blank range, and then sauntered off quite casually. We can bet he was smiling as he left. He also raped and killed his own child's mother, thinking she would rat him out to the authorities. These violent tendencies, far from a liability, actually got him promoted. He went from a small-time gang to a member of an international drug trafficking organization. Once he made the FBI's most wanted, he planned to kill whoever would ultimately discover him. Given his history, everyone knew he would do just that if given the opportunity. In fact, by the time he was caught, he was feared by both rival gangs as well as his own. Fortunately for them all, he will end his life behind bars. Number 9 is Gary Ray Bowles. Bowles began his life of crime in Florida when he both beat and strangled the man he was living with for unknown reasons. He then went to Maryland where he crossed paths with David Jarman, who he also strangled before robbing. Weeks after this, he was in Georgia staying with a 72-year-old man who died similarly to the others. His next murder was the most brutal though. Albert Morris had been gagged and beaten, shot with a shotgun and strangled. Bowles stayed in the home of his next and last victim for days with the body in the back room. Clearly, he had an indifference to human life and thought nothing of choking, shooting, and beating people to death. Many who viewed the scenes of his crimes noted that his brutality was far beyond what was necessary. Due to the nature of his crimes, Bowles was sentenced to death, twice. Initially, it was reversed by the Florida Supreme Court, but then he was given the same sentence yet again. Number 8 is Richard Lee Tingler Jr. On one September morning in 1968, the bodies of four adults were discovered in an Ohio park. They had been shot at least once in the head, if not multiple times. A little over a month later, a 15-year-old boy and an 18-year-old girl working in a store were tied up and robbed. The thief decided to leave no witnesses. Removing the door from the safe, he used it to savagely beat the teens and then shot each in the head. The store owner, who was also present, somehow survived. She had been strangled with a wire hanger, but it knocked her unconscious and the thief didn't quite finish the job. Richard Lee Tingler was eventually suspected of the attacks through various evidence. He made the most wanted fugitives list in December of 1968 and began to use a fake identity to escape punishment. A few months later, he killed a 49-year-old man and robbed him of his vehicle and money. However, at this point, his days were numbered, and he had drawn quite a bit of attention. Further, he looked a lot like the man in the FBI's most wanted poster. He was apprehended and the cost of his crimes was death. Number 7 is Eric Rudolph. Eric Rudolph carried out the bombings in the South starting in the summer of 1996 when he placed a bomb concealed with a backpack in a busy Atlanta park. He had put nails in the device so they would work as shrapnel and shatter bone and slice apart skin, flesh, and blood vessels. Two people were killed while over 100 others were hurt when it went off. His purpose was to cancel the Olympics and make the government take a financial hit due to its stance on abortion. However, that was just part of his plan, and he went on to cause three more explosions. With these, he made it so that additional bombs would follow the first in hopes of injuring those responding to the scene. The targets included an abortion clinic and a gay nightclub, resulting in several injuries. The last explosion was at another clinic in Alabama, which killed an officer but left a witness. This person had license plate numbers which led police straight to Rudolph. Police found evidence in his house that implicated him in the bombings, but he fled to escape punishment. Caught not long after, he now faces five life sentences. Number 6 is Christopher Wilder Christopher Wilder was known for his hand in construction and real estate, but began a second occupation in 1984. For about a month and a half, he became a murderer as he drove from Florida to California and after that to New York. Preying on attractive women everywhere, he became known as the Beauty Queen Killer. Sadly, he was quite successful at what he did. He abducted a minimum of 12 women during his journey and killed 8 of them by the time it ended. Hardly a looker himself, he attracted the ladies by showing off his shiny cars and fancy real estate. He also bought cameras and would lure them in by promising to take modeling pictures. In February, Rosario Gonzalez disappeared and Elizabeth Kenyon, who had dated Wilder, vanished after rejecting a proposal of marriage. Both were placed in locations with Wilder before they went missing. Private investigators soon leaked his description to the press, and after withdrawing cash, he fled the area. It was Linda Grover who had wanted to be on a magazine cover that later identified him. Wilder had hit, strangled, and shocked her, and even glued her eyes closed, yet somehow she survived. 
In fact, she screamed loudly enough to scare him off. Still, he wasn't caught and so another woman was drugged, stabbed, beaten and tossed in the woods. Fortunately, she lived, while others didn't. He continued this behavior as he passed through additional states until he snatched his very last victim. He was then shot and killed in Canada while fighting an officer for his gun. Number 5 is James Whitey Bulger James Bulger was arrested at the age of 13 and would spend the rest of his life in and out of prison. This included a 1956 arrest for bank robberies in three states. After nine years behind bars, he joined the Winter Hill Gang before befriending Stephen J. Flemmy. Flemmy would become his partner in crime as well as a fellow FBI informant. Both men reported on the Mafia for the benefit of the US government. Being informants hardly tempered their own activities. Both are linked to many crimes and Bulger has ties to as many as 19 homicides. Some of these were members of rival gangs, such as James O'Toole who was shot by an automatic rifle before taking a bullet to the head. Others were suspected of providing the FBI with damaging information on Bulger, such as John B. Callahan who died by brutal execution style shot to the back of the head. There were also people in the wrong place at the wrong time, such as Michael Donahue or Michael Milano. Both were simply too close to the intended target. It didn't seem to matter to Bulger one bit how many people he killed or for what reason. However, his own welfare was certainly important. He fled and spent the next 16 years in hiding before he and his girlfriend were apprehended in 2012. At his trial, Bulger claimed that he had been granted immunity by the Department of Justice in exchange for his services as an informant. However, this claim was ignored and he was found guilty for his role in a staggering 11 homicides. Number 4 is Ted Bundy Bundy landed a spot on the FBI's top 10 fugitives list in February of 1978. Five days later, he was arrested after going too fast in a vehicle he had stolen. Years would pass before he met his end in an electric chair called Old Sparky, and those outside the prison set off fireworks after his execution. But what did he do for his death to be celebrated like the 4th of July? His time of crime began in the mid-70s, when women began to disappear in Washington and Oregon. When he moved to Utah for school, women went missing there too. Turns out he was murdering them. He would often pretend to need help or be a figure of authority and lure victims to remote locations. Once there, he would rape and beat them to death. And that's not even the worst of it. He would revisit the scenes of the crimes to carry out various sexual acts on the bodies. This continued until they were too badly decomposed to make it possible. He also had a collection of human heads in his home. Bundy escaped suspicion because he was attractive and charming, and at one point he even convinced a mayor to write him a letter of recommendation. This likely became quite an embarrassment later. After all, Bundy was a serial killer and one of the most depraved to ever live. Before his death, Bundy admitted he killed 36 women, but many think it's over 100. Number 3 is Rafael Caro Quintero, the narco of narcos, who helped create the Guadalajara cartel. He made large profits off of shipments of marijuana that were brought into the United States. But he is known for much more than trafficking drugs. In addition to countless other atrocities, he allegedly abducted DEA agent Enrique Camarena, his pilot, an American writer, and a dentistry student. He then tortured and murdered them. As far as the writer and the student, their offense was to have accidentally disrupted a party. As punishment, they were taken into a room and tortured while questioned. The writer died due to blunt force trauma while the student was buried alive. They were not discovered until months had passed. Some suspect that Quintero thought they were spies, which they weren't. Undercover DEA agent Enrique Camarena was very much a spy and had done considerably worse. He had brought authorities to one of Quintero's marijuana ranches and 10,000 tons of plants were destroyed. Over one and a half hundred million in profits were lost. Quintero wanted revenge. He had Camarena and his pilot kidnapped and they were delivered to him at the Guadalajara residence. When he first saw Camarena, he gave him a hug before leading him to a room where he was hit and burned nonstop for hours. It's believed a physician injected him with something as he passed out so he would wake up and be tortured some more. During this process, a man would later allege the Mexican Defense Minister, Interior Minister, Federal Judicial Police Director, and Mexican Interpol Director were in the living room listening. By the time Camarena died, it was morning. His and his pilot's bodies were found in the ground wrapped in plastic and filled with bullets. Quintero is still at large after he was released on a strange technicality and fled before he was recaptured. Number 2 is Ramzi Ahmed Youssef As a young man, Youssef studied bomb making and recruited terrorists on Al-Qaeda's behalf. Soon his role expanded. He met with Oman Abdel Rahman, 
a cleric in New York, for the support of materials for an attack on the World Trade Center there. He planned it out and helped with the design of a 1,500-pound bomb. This was then driven into the building's garage. When it went off, six were killed and more than a thousand more were injured. However, this one success was followed by multiple failures. Youssef allegedly plotted to kill the Pakistani leader Benazir Bhutto, but first explosives went off in his face and then a sniper's gun was delayed in transit. He was also linked to the attempted bombing of the Bangkok-based Israeli embassy. However, when the man driving the bomb got in an accident, he fled, leaving the explosives to be discovered. Yusuf's idea of sneaking liquid nitroglycerin into 11 US planes and then exploding them over the Pacific Ocean was not a success either. Asked to assassinate President Clinton, he believed it was too complex, and though he tested the method to kill the Pope, he never implemented it. So while he killed several and injured hundreds, he wasn't the smartest criminal out there. In fact, he was mixing up chemicals when he started a fire that drew police to the scene. He fled but left behind key evidence on planned acts of terrorism. Just one month later, he had been captured and sentenced to life in prison, and there was more than enough evidence against him. Number 1 is Osama Bin Laden As a young man, Bin Laden came to believe in the ideas of Abdullah Azam. These were that Muslims should wage jihad or holy war and form one Islamic state. When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 1979, Bin Laden went with Azam to support the rebels and recruit others to join the movement. Their success gave him confidence, and he created Al-Qaeda with the goal of carrying out more symbolic acts of terror. The group caused a lot of destruction. It armed Somali soldiers who killed 18 Americans and was implicated in the New York World Trade Center bombing that same year. There is also evidence it tried to kill the Egyptian president, bombed a US training facility, and brought down an American military building within a few years. By 1998, over 200 people had died and thousands more were injured in explosions at several embassies. This landed Bin Laden on the FBI's most wanted list, but his crimes only continued. In 2000, he took credit for the bombing of an American warship which killed another 17. While indicted of the bombings, Bin Laden lost no time and went about planning the attacks of September 11, 2001. This was the biggest strike yet, with the Pentagon and the World Trade Center as targets. 2,753 people died as a result. However, in May of 2011, President Obama was able to state that justice had been done and the bloodthirsty Al-Qaeda leader was dead. His body was shipped by an aircraft carrier into the Indian Ocean and buried there in an underwater grave. Wanted, a reward is being offered for this fugitive by the FBI. The poster stares back at you with ten sinister-looking faces, the worst of the worst, so notorious that the FBI is offering a massive reward for anyone who provides information leading to their capture. Who are the FBI's ten most wanted in the year 2021? Number 10. Yasser Abdel Saeed Saeed began his life in a humble way as an immigrant from Egypt in 1983. He soon married an American woman 15 years his junior. They had a son and two daughters. He became a citizen, and there was a dark side to this American success story. His daughters, Amina and Sarah, soon started telling their friends and family that their father was abusive. The girls would occasionally show up with bruises and injuries at school. They reported that their father spied on them, with Sarah even finding out that he was spying on her at her part-time job. But his obsession was about to take an even darker turn. Amina covertly started dating a boy, and when Saeed planned to move the family, she planned to run away with her boyfriend. Eventually, Patricia had enough of her husband and left with the girls only for Yasser to follow them. He convinced his wife to return home with the girls, and when the teenagers refused, Saeed shot them both and killed them. Saeed then went on the run, assumed to have fled back to Egypt, but he was later seen as a cab driver around New York City. He spent 12 years on the FBI's most wanted list with a reward of $100,000 offered for his capture. In 2020, he was found in Texas and he and his son were arrested. He currently awaits trial on capital murder charges but remains on the list because his case is ongoing. But this next fugitive is still in the wild. Number 9. Robert William Fisher A Navy veteran and firefighter, Fisher seemed like the picture of an all-American guy in 2001, but his public face hit a darker side. His wife and two kids lived in fear of his explosive temper. He was reportedly deeply bitter over his own parents' divorce, and he was controlling toward his wife and children. He displayed other bizarre behavior like shooting stray dogs and smearing animal blood on his face. But no one expected what was to come on April 9, 2001, when people in the neighborhood heard a terrible argument at the Fisher home. Then the explosion happened. The house blew up the next morning, 
and firefighters battled the fast-moving blaze before finding the bodies of Fisher's wife and kids in the house. But they hadn't died in the fire, they had been murdered. Fisher was on the run, having been seen at an ATM hours before the explosion. He was indicted for three counts of first-degree murder but has managed to stay ahead of police for 20 years now. His military background and his experience as a hunter makes him a particularly dangerous fugitive, and the FBI has offered $100,000 for information leading to his capture. This next fugitive was basically a ghost. Number 8. Alexis Flores It was summer 2000 when Philadelphia resident Jorge Contreras took pity on a homeless drifter calling himself Carlos. He gave the unfortunate man shelter, gave him clothing to wear, and paid for his work as a handyman. But this would lead to a horrifying discovery. Carlos had used his shelter to store the body of Ariana de Jesus, a little girl who had been missing for several days. Contreras recognized the shirt she was wrapped in as being the one he had given to Carlos, and a manhunt began for the drifter. But who actually was Carlos? All they had of him was a vague sketch, including a distinctive scar he had on his neck. Two years later, an undocumented immigrant named Alexis Flores would be arrested for shoplifting in Arizona, and the charges would later be upgraded due to false documents. He was deported to Honduras after his prison term, and that would be a terrible mistake. In 2007, his DNA would be matched to the De Jesus murder. Carlos finally had a name, but he was out of the FBI's reach now. And the US and Honduras do not have an extradition treaty. The FBI is offering $100,000 for information leading to his capture, and Interpol is involved as well, but he remains at large. This next fugitive began his crime spree at the most humble of locations. Number 7. Badresh Kumar Chitinbhai Patel One of the youngest fugitives on the list, Patel seemed like a normal young man in India. He had married his wife Palak by 2015 and the young couple had traveled to the United States to visit relatives. Their visit became an extended one, and they took a job at a local Dunkin Donuts owned by his relative, where they worked the night shift together on April 12th. But only one of them would leave that night. They walked into the camera, disappeared off the view of the camera, and then Patel left alone and closed the store. The next people in the store would find something horrible. When no one seemed to be on staff, customers approached a police officer and found Palak's body in the back, beaten and stabbed. They quickly fingered her husband for the killing, but Patel had already escaped. He was last seen taking a hotel shuttle to the airport, and authorities believe he may have fled back to India or be hiding with relatives. What turned this young man into a murderer? Relatives report his wife wanted to return home to India. Wherever he is now, he's been on the run since 2015, and the FBI thinks he's worth a $100,000 reward. But youth is no deterrent for this next criminal. Number 6. Alejandro Castillo It was 2016 and a 17-year-old Castillo worked at a Greek-themed restaurant in Charlotte, North Carolina, but he was more interested in girls than his job. He had eyes in particular for his co-worker, Truk Kwan Sandy Lai Lee, who was six years older than him. They briefly dated and she even lent him some money, which he never paid back. But even as he went on to dating another co-worker, he never stopped thinking about Sandy, and that fixation soon turned into a dangerous obsession. And then Sandy disappeared. Investigations showed that Castillo had contacted her saying he would pay her back. Instead, he took her at gunpoint to an ATM and made her empty her bank account. He then drove her to the woods, shot her, and dumped her body in a ravine. The teenage murderer then fled in her car along with his new girlfriend, Ahima Feister. They headed to the border and crossed into Mexico, but only a few months later, Feister turned herself in to authorities. She cooperated for a lesser sentence and reported that Castillo had gone missing while they were in Mexico, disappearing off the radar. He's still at large, with a $100,000 award offered for his capture. He wasn't the only Romeo turned murderer on the list. Number 5. Arnoldo Jimenez Everything seemed to be going right for Arnaldo Jimenez and Estela Carrera. They were happily engaged, had a two-year-old daughter along with Jimenez's nine-year-old daughter from a previous relationship, and on May 11, 2012, they were married at Chicago City Hall. They celebrated at a nightclub with their friends and family and then drove home in Jimenez's car. That's when things took a dark turn. The newlywed started arguing and Carrera quickly discovered that her husband had a dark side. It would be a one-night marriage. Jimenez stabbed his wife fatally and dragged her body into their apartment, leaving it in the bathtub in her wedding dress. When she never picked up her children, she was reported missing and her body was found by police, and Jimenez had disappeared. 
Police tracked him from Illinois to Tennessee to Arkansas to Texas and eventually to Mexico. They were able to arrest his brother for drugs and find more evidence linking him to the murder, but he remains a fugitive with a $100,000 bounty south of the border. Age was no barrier for this next criminal in the other direction. Number 4. Eugene Palmer It was 2012 when Eugene Palmer lived next to his son and daughter-in-law in Stony Point, New York. The 73-year-old man watched as his son's marriage fell apart, and eventually his daughter-in-law Tammy filed for a restraining order and threatened divorce. This could cause Eugene to have to leave his home, and he wouldn't stand for that. A nasty feud began between Eugene and his daughter-in-law, and on September 24th he took action. Tammy walked her children to the bus, returned home, and suddenly came under fire. Eugene was targeting her with a shotgun, and after three shots he finished the job. The senior sharpshooter then fled the scene in a pickup truck, which he abandoned later and fled into the woods. Police led a hunt in the woods with dogs which tracked his scent to a campground, but no trace of him was ever found. His family believes he's likely dead. After all, how far could a diabetic man with a heart condition now pushing 80 get? But the FBI disagrees. They pointed out that Palmer was an avid outdoorsman and could easily have survived in the woods and fled to another state. And they've offered a $100,000 reward for his capture. But some fugitives command a higher price. Number 3. Jason Derrick Brown Jason Derrick Brown had a very unlikely beginning for a wanted fugitive. He was a devout Mormon who served a missionary and owned a toy business. But he had a taste for expensive vehicles and was deeply in debt. He escalated from fraud to theft in home invasions to a robbery that went horribly wrong. In 2004, he bought a Glock pistol and went to a local AMC theater in Phoenix. There, armored car guard Robert Keith Polymeris was collecting the weekend box office. A hooded gunman came out of nowhere and shot him six times, killing him. The gunman fled with $56,000. It wasn't long before the killing would be linked to Brown. They found his bicycle and found the amateur robber's DNA on it. He was quickly charged with first-degree murder and unlawful flight, but by then he had fled to Las Vegas. Authorities found his car abandoned, and his brother was later charged with obstruction of justice for helping him dispose of evidence. Brown's case became notorious, and sightings of him came from across the United States, Mexico, and Canada. But the genuine article has eluded capture for over 15 years and the FBI has offered a $200,000 reward for his capture. But the FBI also has their eye on some much larger scale criminals. Number 2. Jose Rodolfo Villarreal Hernandez Villarreal Hernandez was born into a life of violence. His father was a member of the Beltran Leva cartel in Mexico and was murdered by the rival Gulf cartel. It was no surprise that Villarreal Hernandez's involvement in the family business only got more intense and he had a target in mind for revenge. Juan Jesus Guerrero Chapa, a powerful lawyer for the Gulf cartel, now living in South Lake, Texas, and an informant for U.S. law enforcement. But that wouldn't stop Villarreal Hernandez, who hired a crew to sneak into the U.S. And on May 22, 2013, they would strike. As Guerrero entered his car, two assassins pulled up and fired multiple shots at him. He was killed immediately. While the assassins escaped, three men connected to their hiring were arrested and named Villarreal Hernandez as the mastermind. While he remains at large in Mexico, the FBI is on the hunt and has offered a million dollar reward for his arrest. But they're not the only ones looking. Guerrero's sister targeted one of Villarreal Hernandez's relatives in revenge, even sending her brother's hitman a picture of the severed head. With enemies like this, Villarreal Hernandez may want to think about turning himself in. But there's one fugitive more wanted than a cartel hitman, a cartel ringleader. Number 1. Rafael Caro Quintero Rafael Caro Quintero had humble beginnings as a farmer, but his crop of choice would lead to a lot of trouble. He grew marijuana, and that turned him from a simple worker into a local land baron. He worked for many of Mexico's most notorious gang leaders and became a successful drug trafficker in the 1970s. But he would soon branch out on his own and he formed the Guadalajara Cartel. He shipped mass quantities of marijuana to the United States, but would be most notorious for his kidnapping, torture, and murder of US DEA agent Enrique Camarena and four others. He would eventually be sentenced to 40 years in prison for murder in Mexico. But there's a twist to his story coming. A state court ruled that he'd been tried improperly and ordered him set free in 2013. This caused outrage across the border and diplomatic pressure forced Mexico to reopen an investigation. They eventually issued a new arrest warrant and US and Mexican forces continue to pursue him to this day. He remains at large, with his attorneys trying to get the charges dismissed but failing. With Interpol and the FBI looking for him, the notorious drug kingpin commands the highest reward for any criminal on the FBI's most wanted list a stunning $20 million. 
See any of them in your neighborhood? <laughs> Keep your eyes open and approach carefully. <laughs> September 23, 1983. It's the end of the evening shift for the staff at the Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet in Kilgore, Texas. As the last customers leave, there's a lot of laughing and joking. It's Friday night, time to have some fun. The main door then swings open. A warm breeze hits the startled staff. We're close, says the assistant manager. None of them return home that night. The next time anyone sees them, they're lying dead on the ground, executed. Let's now try our best to understand what happened that night. First, the victims. They were Opie Hughes, 39, Mary Tyler, 37, David Maxwell, 20, Joey Johnson, 20, and Monty Landers, 19. Tyler was the assistant manager, Hughes was one of the staff, as were Johnson and Maxwell. Landers shouldn't have even been there that day, he just popped in to see the two young men. We know that the staff had already pretty much finished up for the night. They'd almost finished cleaning up the place, the money had been counted, and the franchise headquarters had been called and been told about the takings. During the call, though, some voices could be heard in the background, possibly the voices of the killers. That phone call was the last time anyone heard the staff speak, besides the killers, of course. At around 11 p.m., Mary Tyler's daughter, Kim, walked into the restaurant expecting to see her mom. What she found instead was an eerie silence. Perplexed, shouting her mom's name, she looked down at the floor. She panicked when she saw fresh blood. The cops were soon on the scene, but none of the staff could be found. At first, police assumed that some hijinks had taken place and the staff maybe had a fight, or someone had an accident, and possibly they were all nearby. No one thought massacre. But that's what it was. The next day, about 15 miles from the restaurant at a remote field close to an oil well, all five victims were found. The first police on the scene couldn't believe what they saw. It looked like an execution from a war crime photograph. All the victims were lying face down in the grass and dirt, their arms tucked under their bodies, their heads all pointing northward. Four of them were close together while the other body of Opie Hughes lay not so far away. They'd all been shot in the back of the head, with at least one of them also taking a bullet to the back. Danny Pirtle, who would lead the investigation, later said in court that it was plainly obvious how they died without having to wait for autopsy. What he didn't know is that the carnage he was looking at would become one of the worst unsolved crimes in modern U.S. history. Well, it remained unsolved for over two decades and, to some extent, still is partially unsolved, but we'll get around to that. As some of you sleuths out there already know, a lot of murders are committed by people very close to the victim. You rarely have to look further than a spurned ex-lover, a jilted friend, or an angry business associate to find the person responsible. But in this in this case, things just didn't look that way. The murderers got away with around $2,000 that night, but even so, killing five people over such a small sum didn't make sense. What's more, it wasn't as if the staff were all connected other than the fact that they worked together. Sure, the young guys were friends, but police knew fairly certain that they weren't involved in gangs or high-level drug activity, and they weren't prone to hanging out with women in their late 30s. The crime looked like the work of a maniac. But then, the most messed up killers out there don't tend to take the money too. They kill for fun, for sport, to attend to some crazed sexual fetish, but they don't usually run off with the loot. At first, the investigators wondered if the murders had anything to do with a methamphetamine ring that had filled the streets of Kilgore with that pernicious drug. They knew that the ring was looking for a new recipe for cooking meth. Aside from that, after prolonged binges, meth heads do tend to lose the plot sometimes. But when they spoke to the manager of the branch, the manager said, no way, those folks were not part of any ruthless criminal gang. They weren't meth sellers, and she believed they weren't even meth consumers. Speaking later of one of the 20-year-old men, she said, they were good, they were exceptional, they were good kids. The police started looking at Kim, Mary's 17-year-old stepdaughter. She recently started working at that KFC, and she had a somewhat checkered past for a young person. So much so, she spent some time at the Louisiana home for girls after exhibiting behavioral problems. But why would she have had her mother killed? Why would this young woman have a beef with a bunch of guys just a little older than her? That line of inquiry led to nothing because Kim had absolutely no reason to have anyone shot. It seemed to the police that a robbery had taken place, but perhaps one or more of the staff had refused to hand over the cash. Some kind of fight ensued in which one of the staff was injured. Not wanting to leave any witnesses, the gunmen then abducted the staff and took them to that oil field to kill them. Still, the autopsy didn't state that anyone had died before anyone else. It revealed that all of them were lined up at the oil field and they were shot one by one. One. Only Hughes, who was dragged away, was shot separately. There were few clues to work with. Cops found a fingernail in the clothing of one of the bodies. They found traces of another human on Hughes's body. But the best clue was a bit of blood on the ground and a blood-stained napkin lying nearby. As we said, there was also some blood in the restaurant. It didn't look as though it had come from any of the victims. Perhaps, the police thought, one of the staff really had put up a good fight and injured one of the perpetrators. People came forward and said they saw a van at the restaurant that night, which could have taken the victims away. But there was no CCTV back then in the area, and those witness statements 
statements were vague at best. Police also looked at two men named Romeo Pinkerton and Darnell Hartsfield. They were cousins and they both had a checkered past, while another man linked to those two was also on the police radar. But then jail records seemed to point to the fact that Hartsfield was in jail at the time of the murders, so that trail went dry. Such a slaying, something of the utmost brutality, put a lot of pressure on the cops. That's not always a good thing. It can make police join too many dots, and as we all know, many an innocent man has gone to jail when the police can't quite look past the picture they've already formed in their mind. It's called having a cognitive bias, and quite a few people have spent time on death row because of it. The police were quick to join the dots when they were arresting a man named James Earl Mankins Jr. He had a pretty colorful rap sheet, mostly for drug convictions. Notably, Mankins' father was a state representative. Police discovered that the fingernail they found looked as though it came from him. He was also missing a bit of his. A man named James Rowe said he approached the police by himself a few months after the crime. That night, he said he saw men driving a van and he noticed that in the back of the van were people wearing uniforms. What's scary is he said he heard them yelling and screaming. He also said the driver of the van was a white guy with long hair and a beard. That fit the description of Mankins, although Rowe was never asked to testify. Why people never approached him again, we don't know. It wasn't until 20 years later that he did testify, and he said he went to school with Mankins and the man in the van wasn't him. Later in 1995, DNA evidence pointed to Mankins' innocence, and the case against him was dropped. Some years later, it would be discovered that this fingernail the police had been so dead set on investigating actually came from one of the victims. Mankins later told the press, the worst part was the six months in jail over there thinking about being put to death for something I didn't do, and more than likely if it wasn't for that DNA, I would have been on death row. The case went cold again and it looked as though they'd never find the killers. A detective later admitted that the police had spent way too much time focusing on Mankins. Tunnel vision is an investigator's worst enemy, so sometime later the Russ County Sheriff's Office called a former FBI agent named George Kinney and asked him to look at the case from different angles. It seemed to Kinney that, given the severity of the crimes, whoever had done it had very likely committed more crimes in the years that had passed. It would be fair to assume, he thought, that the murderers were in prison for crimes as he began his investigation in the early 2000s. In 2001, a forensic scientist named Lorna Beasley retested the DNA evidence the police had and ran it through something called the Combined DNA Data Indexing System. That way, she could ascertain if the DNA from the blood found at the crime scene matched the DNA of violent offenders currently behind bars. Two names popped up. They were Romeo Pinkerton and Darnell Hartsfield. Ha! Huh, she thought. Those guys were suspects at the start, but we rubbed them from the list when it was discovered one of them was in jail when the murders happened. That wasn't true. The cops had messed up in that regard. On the night of the slayings, he'd been out of prison two days. But the evidence still wasn't enough to charge the men for their crime. It took two more years for a Texas Attorney General prosecutor Lisa Tanner to get on the case. She had doubts about finding the culprits so many years after the crime. Witnesses were getting old, and she said there were quite a few holes in the entire story. She also realized that DNA evidence pointed to three men committing the crime, not two. What she needed was DNA from one of the two suspects for whom she did have names. One of them was Hartsfield, and investigators got a break in 2003 when he was arrested. Now investigators just needed a DNA sample from him, but he wasn't exactly forthcoming about that. So investigators embarked on a plan that had fooled many criminals in the past, offering drinks or chewing gum, and then testing the remains. With Hartsfield, they got an added bonus. He flat out refused to give investigators a DNA sample, and that was his legal right. He even stated that in a letter. Oops. Tanner later told the press this. He told us he wasn't going to give us his blankety-blank DNA. And then he was so adamant about it, he wrote us a letter saying, I'm not giving you my DNA, and you can't make me give you my DNA. And then, of course, he licked the envelope and sent it to us. In 2007, facing the death penalty due to the new DNA evidence, he admitted to murdering those five people. Still, he said he only did so because five life sentences was better than a shot of lethal drugs into the arm. Pinkerton also received five life sentences. Hartsfield has since spoken from his cell, and he hasn't changed his story of being innocent. He once said, I might have had crimes that I did do, you know what I'm saying? But no one ever got hurt. I would never kill these people. And from day one, I have stated my innocence and I'm still stating my innocence. The investigators say they have now joined the dots and the picture they have come up with they are sure is real. They say the guys, possibly three guys, heard someone talking about the takings that evening, but they mistakenly heard 15,000, not 1,500. Some reports we found said 2,000 was taken and some said 3,000, so we can't be sure just how much was stolen. Investigators think the robbery just went wrong and for some reason they abducted the five people. Why they murdered them all, they just don't know. They 
admit that the crime cannot be said to be solved until that third person is arrested. The DNA evidence found on Hugh's body does not match Hartsfield, Pinkerton, or Mankins, or anyone else in the DNA database. The guy we mentioned at the start, former detective Pirtle, said, I think about it every day, and I lie awake some nights with it on my mind. It's been a big part of my life, and though I'm retired now, I still want the third person. Hartsfield fought his conviction, and in 2010 a court upheld it, saying the evidence against him was solid. He still claims his innocence today, saying the real killer is still out there. This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at www.dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, according to its own website, was started in 1908, but at that point it was called the Bureau of Investigation, or BOI. There had been interstate crime-fighting organizations before this, doing things like looking for what was perceived as dangerous anarchists and regulating state-to-state -state commerce, but 1908 is generally said to be the beginning of the FBI. Before it got that abbreviation, it was also called the United States Bureau of Investigation, and later the Division of Investigation. The US was growing in size and population and crime was growing with it. As the FBI website states, inventions like the telephone, the telegraph, and the railroad had seemed to shrink its vast distances even as the country had spread west. After years of industrializing, America was wealthier than ever too, and a new world power on the block. But what that meant was that criminals could be more sophisticated, they could get organized, and while this was happening, official corruption was rife. This was the dawn of hypercriminality in the US. US, and regular police forces were either ill-equipped or even on the payroll of criminals. Something had to change, and a man called J. Edgar Hoover was made director of the FBI in 1924. He'd stay in that position for a long time, and this controversial figure wasn't always very ethical. We'll get around to ethics, or lack thereof, soon. Hoover was put in charge of creating the Scientific Crime Detection Laboratory, the FBI Lab, in 1932. He would begin a war on crime, and on his hands by the end of his tenure in 1972 was a lot of blood. This wasn't just the blood of machine gun toting gangsters, but people who were sometimes called radicals. The FBI no doubt had a job to do, but looking back, no one, even the FBI, disagrees that its modus operandi was often quite oppressive. And so, we might first talk about something called the Palmer Raids. These were conducted from November 1919 to January 1920, during what was called the Red Scare. America didn't want any damned commies tainted its land of free people, and President Woodrow Wilson at the time told these new federal cops that leftists, anarchists, communists, perhaps even anyone with a radicalized view that didn't fit with the capitalist ethos, should be captured and thrown out of the country. The problem was, you could say this operation didn't always embrace human rights. Often, anyone who just didn't look right was arrested and people's houses were searched without warrants. That's why some historians write that the operation was a series of violent and abusive law enforcement enforcement raids. Not only were the raids a breach of rights in some cases, but the deportations that followed were sometimes really not warranted. Government officials had been attacked and bombs had been sent by mail, while people were rioting over what they deemed unfair pay. But the ensuing crackdown we might say today was a little OTT. Take for example when around 200 Russian immigrants were studying at something called the Russian People's House in New York City. Cops went in and reportedly just started beating folks with billy clubs. It said one algebra class was interrupted and the teacher was beaten in front of students. Some of those students were arrested and had their money taken from them by the police. In fact, across the country, thousands of people were detained on suspicion for months on end, and they weren't allowed lawyers. In one case, a man called Gaspar Canone was arrested without being charged. He then wouldn't admit to being a communist, so the cops just forged his signature, saying he was, and then he was deported. When it was done and dusted, thousands of people across the US had been tortured tortured, beaten, held for no reason, deported, even starved in one case of a thousand detainees, and many, most in fact, were innocent. The whole thing was a disgrace, but it took time for the government to admit the full extent of the damage done. A positive thing that came out of it was these raids resulted in the formation of the American Civil Liberties Union. Every cloud has a silver lining, but try telling that to those who suffered the most. So those were the early days when the FBI used extrajudicial powers to cause pain and embrace injustice. But the the threat of a communist uprising stayed with America and many others would unnecessarily be hurt. What you might not know is that the FBI had lots of
of informants who would tell them if they suspected anyone they knew was a communist. One of those was the actor Ronald Reagan, a man who would become president. Before that, the FBI believed that many communist sympathizers were running wild in Hollywood and preaching to the uninitiated. Who better to have on the inside than a famous actor, and it was Reagan, codenamed T-10, that ratted on his fellow Hollywood acquaintances. It's said Reagan and his actress wife Jane Wyman gave a list of names of people working in Hollywood who they thought were a bit on the red side. Reagan was on board as far back as 1941, a long time before he filled the White House big seat. No one knew about this for a long time, of course, and when it was discovered, the FBI said his role was minor. Records show that Reagan even added one man to the list he had just got into a drunken debate with over politics. You'll find information on T-10 in a document called Communist Infiltration of the Motion Picture Industry. Now, as you know, the FBI have had all kinds of informants, and many of them were criminals and killers. They had violent Italian mob boss Frank Capa, as well as a long list of other Italian-American mafia figures. They had Whitey Bulger, the Irish-American gangster, as well as many other gangsters all over the country. These assets were needed, and as you know, occasionally the FBI would have to turn a blind eye to some hardcore criminality. But the case of one asset sticks out. This was the case of the African-American man called Elmer Pratt. Pratt served twice in Vietnam, but on his return rose up the ranks of the political organization called the Black Panthers. The FBI didn't much like the Panthers, and they wrote in one document that their intention was to neutralize Pratt, as he had become the organization's Minister of Defense. So they neutralized him, but to do that, they set him up for a murder he didn't commit. The FBI made sure information was withheld from the jury and failed to say that the person who had identified Pratt had earlier said it was someone else. That person was told to make a second guess. He was sentenced to life and served 27 years, spending eight of those in solitary. It was then later discovered that the trial was a charade of justice, and one man who had said Pratt had discussed the murder with him was actually an FBI informant. The man was a major factor in him being committed. Pratt was released and given four and a half million dollars in compensation. You might also not know that in order to keep its assets, the FBI had or has to allow a lot of crimes to take place. According to one document the agency released, in 2011 alone, it allowed 5,658 crimes to happen. On average, 15 a day. Or did you know that you don't have to be arrested for the FBI to have your fingerprints? If you've ever had your prints scanned for anything, they might end up with millions of other fingerprints on the Integrated Automated Fingerprint Identification System in Clarksburg, West Virginia. We should also tell you that if you've ever wanted a genealogical DNA check and have ordered one, the FBI might be able to get their hands on that. This is how the Golden State Killer was caught. He might have found out he was part Native American with a bit of sub-Saharan African ancestry, but the FBI found out who their serial killer was. Another thing the FBI liked to do was smear people, and they did it with a vengeance. We might take the case of young actress Jean Seberg. The FBI wasn't fond of her because she was outspoken about civil rights and she had donated cash to a number of supportive organizations. Records show that the agency had a plan to ruin her life. One document reads, Bureau permission is requested to publicize the pregnancy of Jean Seberg. It's felt that the possible publication of Seberg's plight could cause her embarrassment and serve to cheapen her image with the the general public. It said the stress from the FBI and the publications working with it led to premature labor and her baby living only two days. Still, they kept her phone tapped and honored her with round-the-clock surveillance. She then started finding it hard to land roles in movies. The outcome was suicide, and her ex-husband said the FBI drove her to it. You can find a similar case in someone called Billie Holiday, an FBI public enemy because she sang jazz that defended blacks against cruelty. She was also known to ingest illegal substances, and at the time, jazz and getting high was seen as corrupting the youth. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which is separate from but still linked to the FBI, started a smear campaign and again oppressive surveillance. It's written they did this for years, and then it said they very likely planted drugs on her. As many articles point out, they hunted her and they broke her. She died age 44 from liver cancer, but before that, this is what one person sent to investigate her said, I'm going to do her up so goddamn bad she's going 
going to remember as long as she lives. She also wrote this not long before she died. The hounding and the pressure drove me to think of trying the final solution, death. Just so you know, another famous singer the FBI had under surveillance was former Beatles renegade John Lennon. The agency didn't much like his give peace a chance stance. Those darned hippie English radicals were not welcome in the US, but a member of the public finally rubbed out Lennon's existence. The FBI used quite a lot of women, and perhaps one of the most famous of those was a lady that would become known as the Woman in Red. This was a gal called Anna Kuponyash, who'd gone to the US from Romania in 1909, except she didn't find opportunity there in the best of ways, and ended up selling her body on the streets and in houses of ill repute. The FBI realized she worked in a place where the outlawed John Dillinger liked to go. Kupanyash was arrested for being an alien of low moral character, but told she wouldn't be deported if she helped them catch a guy called John. And she was promised the $10,000 reward, or about $200,000 today. She said she would wear red and go to the movies with Dillinger, and that she did. The outcome was a dead Dillinger, and her only getting half of the reward money. She was also deported soon after. Some say that her deportation was part of a cover-up as the FBI didn't actually kill him that night. A high-ranking member of a violent Australian biker gang has his door kicked in by police. Across the world in Germany, a group of contract killers is caught in a police ambush. From triad members in China to the Sinaloa cartel members in the US, some of the world's worst criminals are being dragged away in handcuffs, all because of a messaging app. This was the sting of all stings, or as the FBI said, it was unprecedented in the world of crime. Some 800 people belonging to the highest echelons of global organized crime, spanning 18 different nations, found themselves in handcuffs. At the time of the writing, this is likely just the start of bigger things to come. The FBI, along with cops all over Europe and the Australian police, had been tracking the goings-on of 300 organized crime groups in 90 countries, not to mention being privy to what they called high-level public corruption. But before we go any further, let's look at how this started. As you know, if you want to move tons of drugs and weapons around the world, you need a kinda social network. But talking about shipping millions of dollars worth of cocaine to Europe via countries in Africa on Facebook or WhatsApp wouldn't really work. That's why criminals use specially made encrypted apps. In the past, this has worked to some extent. Occasionally, law enforcement finds out about these private networks. Take for instance the Canadian company Phantom Secure. It supplied phones that had been modified to provide the utmost security. The company didn't ask who its customers were, or at least that's what it said when the cops bashed down the front doors. It was discovered that one of those customers was the Sinaloa cartel in Mexico, among many other criminal syndicates around the world. The CEO of the company, Vincent Ramos, was arrested but refused to give police a backdoor into the encrypted network. This didn't deter the cops, who later got hold of one of the developers. Police had an idea, thinking, now there's a drought of such secure networks in the world, why don't we get this developer on our side? You see, he was already working on the next totally secure network for another company. That network was called Anon. Along with the Australian Federal Police, the FBI came up with a plan. According to reports, the two agencies came up with the idea while drinking a few beers with each other. They said, why not secretly distribute this developer's new technology and track it? They paid him $120,000 and he didn't have to go to prison, or at least he got reduced time. His name, of course, remains a mystery, otherwise he'd have some of the world's most dangerous people on his back. Now that they had the technology, they just had to get criminal organizations to use the phones. The phones were pretty much useless except for the fact that they had on them a calculator app. This was actually an encrypted messaging service in disguise. Once the user plugged in a code to the calculator, they could send messages and photos knowing or at least thinking that law enforcement would never see them. And boy, as you'll see, they pretty much sent everything through these phones. This operation was called Operation Trojan Shield, officially starting in 2018, but of course the police wanted to give the criminals enough time to really put themselves in it. They also needed what they called criminal influencers to spread the word that a new network was out and it was safe. One of them was an Australian drug kingpin named Hakan Ayik. He's now a marked man because he was one of the people that vouched for the phones after he'd been duped into taking some by undercover agents. He's now apparently living the life of luxury somewhere in Turkey, although police have said he is best off handing himself in to us, since a lot of people will likely want him dead. In order to buy one of those phones, you had to know someone in the game and then pay the syndicate that was supplying them. Things just snowballed from there. The more high-profile criminals that used them, the more trusted the phone seemed. 
and by the time 2019 rolled around, they were used all over the world by people belonging to Mexican cartels, various European mafias, and powerful Asian crime syndicates. What the users of the phones didn't know is that law enforcement had the master key to the encryption. So for years, investigators read messages that discussed some of the most serious crimes on the planet. We're talking about the trafficking of explosives and countless weapons, about the trafficking of tons and tons of narcotics, and also about who was in the firing line to get whacked. At first, only 50 phones were distributed in Australia, but soon they started selling like hotcakes. When the sting happened, almost 12,000 phones were being used by 300 transnational criminal organizations in 90 countries. 27 million messages had been intercepted, comprising 45 languages. This is what the Australian Federal Police Commissioner said about what they were reading on a regular basis. We've been in the back pockets of organized crime. All they talk about is drugs, violence, hits on each other, innocent people who are going to be murdered, and a whole range of things. To give you some examples, at one point someone sent in a photograph, in it was hundreds of tons of cocaine that were concealed in shipments of fruit. It seems this shipment wasn't taken by the authorities. Another photo showed hundreds of kilos of cocaine nicely packaged with a Batman label. One of the mini messages read, There is two kilos put aside French diplomatic sealed envelopes out of Bogota. The message then explained that the Colombians could send two kilograms a week, every week, and they wanted 50% of the profits. Another example conversation was between the names Real G and Iron Man. The former said, Southside asked what prices are in Hong Kong per piece. Piece meant kilogram. These kinds of messages led to drug confiscations, such as the 613 kilos of cocaine that was on its way from Ecuador to Belgium hidden in cans of tuna. When the tuna company was busted, another 1,523 kilos of cocaine was found also headed to Belgium. In fact, four tons of cocaine was intercepted. After the arrests were made, the confiscations included eight tons of cocaine, 22 tons of cannabis and resin, two tons of amphetamine and methamphetamine, as well as six tons of chemicals used to make drugs. On top of that, police seized 250 firearms, 55 luxury vehicles, an unreported amount of cryptocurrency, and almost $200 million in cash. The users of the phone were so sure that their privacy was covered that they didn't really try very hard to use any kind of code. Police even discovered how criminals did dry runs, which were basically sending containers without narcotics in them just to see how fast things happened and if there were problems with customs. Knowing that cops had so many organized crime figures in their hands and they were preventing untold amounts of illegal drugs from getting to their destinations, you might wonder why they decided in 2021 to swoop down and arrest all the names they had. This was the FBI's explanation. This was an ideal time to take it down. We decided, based on the amount of crime that was occurring, the threats to life, it was time to get these criminals off the street. The agency said that during the years that the operation had been going on, police in various countries had managed to mitigate threats to life, meaning they somehow prevented the murders from happening. At the time of the arrests, 10 people in Sweden were apparently on their kill list. 155 people were arrested in that country, while 60 people in Germany and 49 people in Belgium were also arrested. 200 folks in Australia got that early morning call from the cops too. Spain and Serbia also saw lots of arrests, but as you know, the number of people who used the app was huge. Even though this is a massive bust, it won't put too large a dent in the distribution of drugs around the world. The Anon app was said to be used by a small number of organized crime members, especially when you consider how many there actually are. Australian police said there may be many more similar technologies out there they just don't yet know about. Or maybe they don't know about them. Charles Albright was a middle-aged man, well-educated, friendly, and successful. At 57 years old, he became the terror known as the Eyeball Killer. Albright was born in 1933 and adopted at three weeks old. Although Albright himself would never know the truth, he was told that his mother was a very talented law student with a bright future ahead of her, until she secretly married another student and got pregnant. Her wealthy father demanded she annul the marriage and give up the baby for adoption, or else he would cut her off from the family. His adopted mother, Dell, was an extremely doting and overprotective mother. Despite her obvious love for Albright, she had a dark side to her loving nature. She constantly would change his clothes up to three times a day to keep him clean and terrified that he'd catch polio by touching things he shouldn't, she took him to a hospital and forced him to look at all the people in iron lungs. Matter of fact, it's a shame we can't lock modern anti-vaxxers in a polio ward and make them stare at children in iron lungs. Dell's punishments could be a bit extreme as well. Once she made him sit in a dark room as punishment for chewing on her tape measure, and when he refused to nap, she'd physically tie him to his bed. While the punishments never turned into full-blown abuse, they definitely flirted with it. Dell took extra caution to teach Albright good manners and to be polite, a trait he would carry his entire life. 
She also made sure that he was respectful of women, especially trying to instill in Albright a politeness and reference to sex, as she compared his father's constant desire for sex as greedy and disrespectful. As he grew older, she chaperoned him on every date he went, and even phoned his date's parents to reassure them that Albright would be on his best behavior. Dell also placed a strong emphasis on Albright's education, forcing him to practice the piano for 30 minutes a day before the school bus showed up. She also took it upon herself to teach him everything she could about math, reading, and writing, to the point that he was actually bumped up two whole grades in elementary school. All this type of pressure so early in life would take decades to manifest. Another thing Dell taught young Albright, however, was the act of taxidermy via mail-order course. She helped him find dead animals to practice on and taught him how to use a knife to cut a skull open, a spoon to scoop out the brains, and forceps to pluck out the eyes. Albright would remember these lessons well late into his 50s, especially the eyes part. Albright, however, started developing troubling behavior early in his teens. At 13, he had already been arrested for petty theft and aggravated assault. He had developed a penchant for low-yield criminality, seemingly in an act of rebellion against his overprotective mother. Even back then, though, someone knew the trouble that was brewing in that young man's head. As his probation officer, who would later become a psychologist, remarked, he could divorce reality sufficiently from his value system so that he could tell you something false and at the same time actually believe he was telling you the truth. Upon leaving home, Albright was engaging in more serious criminality, and in his first year of college, he was arrested for being part of a burglary ring that had broken into three stores. His overprotective and ever-doting mother begged the court to let her act as his lawyer, and after he was sentenced, begged to let her do the time in his stead. The judge, however, would decline the offer, and Albright would spend his 18th birthday in jail. Out of jail and determined to make a new start for himself, Albright would excel in college, but remained the class clown the entire time. One particular prank, however, would have chilling implications many years later. A friend of his broke up with his girlfriend, known to have very pretty eyes. Albright found all the photos of her his friend had tossed in the trash and cut out the eyeballs. He replaced the eyeballs in the photo of his friend's new girlfriend with the old girlfriend's and then plastered the cutout eyeballs in various places around the frat house. Everyone thought it was hilarious. Nobody could see the warning portent of the twisted monster inside. Albright would flirt with the idea of going to medical school, but did terrible on his entrance exams. Instead, he married his college girlfriend and got a job in Arkansas as a high school teacher. There was only one problem. Albright had lied about his qualifications and even forged them. The scam had involved Albright gaining access to official school district records and altering them, and was eventually discovered when the school he claimed to have graduated from realized he was lying. He was, however, very well liked by the students and the staff, so in order to save themselves and him public embarrassment, the school district quietly dismissed him. Instead, Albright pleaded guilty to fraud and received a single year's probation. Albright and his wife moved and started over. She got a job as a teacher and Albright went on the never-ending series of random gigs. He worked as a designer for an airplane manufacturer, as an illustrator for a patent company, a carpenter, and even made his own baseball bats. Albright even got his beautician's license and got a job as a hairstylist at a salon. It was there that he would convince a friend to pay him $250 to draw his wife's portrait after claiming he was a distinguished artist. For weeks, Albright avoided turning in his finished work, always commenting that he was almost done, but there was one specific detail that needed all his attention. Tired of the excuses, the friend eventually went to Albright's house and discovered the painting. It indeed was beautifully done, almost lifelike in its realism. But there was one thing missing. Right there on his wife's face were two white voids where the eyes should be. Albright's first victim would be found in December of 1990. Mary Pratt, a well-known prostitute in South Dallas, was found naked except for a t-shirt and a bra. Her face and chest was badly bruised as Albright had beaten her before shooting her in the head. Police figured it was a John that had turned bad. It wasn't unusual for prostitutes in the area to be beaten by their clients or pimps. However, Mary had been well-liked and known in the neighborhood. With no witnesses, no murder weapon, and no clues, though, the police had nothing but a cold trail on their hands. About the only clue to the killer's identity would be when Mary's body was autopsied. Albright had shut Mary's eyes after leaving her, and as the coroner opened Mary's eyelids, she was horrified to discover the eyes were missing. It wasn't a hack job, either. Albright had expertly and very deftly cut out each eyeball so as to not cause damage to the surrounding tissue. This earned Albright the distinction of having his case shot up to the FBI. 
who immediately placed him in a national database, identified only by his unusual and grotesque predilection for cutting out eyeballs. Two months later, Albright struck again. His second victim, Susan Peterson, was discovered on the same road where Mary Pratt's body had been dumped. She too had been found nearly naked and she too was a well-known local prostitute. Peterson had too been beaten and then shot in the head, chest, and stomach. When the coroner performed his customary autopsy, he too was shocked to discover the missing eyeballs. Once more, the eyes had been taken with extreme care, leaving no damage to the surrounding tissues at all. The police were fearful of drawing attention to the case, as it would put pressure on the killer to change his killing grounds and ruin the police's chance of catching him. However, with no information to go on, it was decided that it was best to warn the community and open up a tip line. The missing eyes, however, were kept secret until finally leaking to the press. For now, all the cops had to go on was that they were dealing with a man with great surgical skill and that he was a well-known client of the women he had murdered, judging by the ease of his executions. They set up sting operations with undercover agents and noted the plates of every car used by local Johns, then ran them against a national database of criminals with unusual records. It all amounted to nothing, and Albright remained out of the police's radar, for now. On March 19th, the body of Shirley Williams was discovered a half block away from a local elementary school. Williams, too, had been a well-known prostitute, but she was working in a completely different area. Albright had felt the police heat and changed hunting grounds, exactly as the police feared he would. It had been children who found Williams' naked body, crumpled up against a street curb. She was found with facial bruises and a broken nose, with the cause of death being a gunshot wound through the top and back of the head. This time, however, Albright had been in a rush. He had left behind the broken tip of an X-Acto knife, which he was using to perform surgeries. When the news of the third killing went public, prostitutes in the local area fled to other places. Some left the city entirely. Brenda White, a longtime veteran of the streets, however, refused to leave. One night, Albright pulled up to her in a white station wagon and she climbed in. She told him to drive to a local motel, but he refused, saying instead he had a private spot elsewhere. Alarm bells began to ring in White's mind as she never allowed New Johns to take her anywhere but the local motel. She insisted Albright let her out of his car and he became furious. The quick-thinking White, however, sprayed Albright in the face with mace and rushed from the vehicle, leaving Albright howling in pain and screaming that he would kill all the hookers. Retelling her story to two police detectives warning her to stay off the streets, it got the detectives to think about the other stories prostitutes had been saying. One was that of another prostitute known for making up stories, Veronica Rodriguez. She too had said that she'd been attacked by a man matching the description provided by Brenda White. Further, she claimed that the truck driver, Axton Schindler, had actually saved her from the attack. Suspicious police dug into Axton Schindler's background. They discovered that his property was owned by Fred Albright, the now deceased father. They also discovered, however, that Fred Albright owned a house in the vicinity of where the first two killings had taken place. The name Albright stuck in the officer's head, though, until one of them recalled a strange tip he'd received over the phone. A woman who refused to identify herself had called in and said that she was friends with Mary Pratt, who had introduced her to a new boyfriend of hers. The boyfriend was very nice and polite, but Pratt told her that he had a fascination with eyes and that she had found a box of X-Acto blades in his attic. The story had remained completely forgotten until Deputy Walter Cook happened to remember it while going over the case. Albright's photo was shown to his victims, with one immediately identifying him and the other shaking in fear as she got to his photo, taking days to gather the courage to identify him to police. At 2.30 in the morning on March 22nd, a SWAT unit smashed into Charles Albright's home. His flabbergasted wife stumbled out of bed in her nightrobe, screaming in terror as the police dragged the defeated and silent Albright away in handcuffs. At the trial, the evidence was largely circumstantial. Albright had taken great pains to avoid leaving any clues behind. In the end, the jury found Albright guilty only of Shirley Williams' murder. However, they recommended and received a life sentence. Today, Albright remains in prison with no possibility of parole. But when asked about the missing eyeballs, he remained steadfast that he never once cut out their eyeballs. Instead, he insists the police did that themselves in order to hype up the case. The X-Files, one of TV's most popular science fiction series with a recent reboot, follows the adventures of agents Mulder and Scully as they unravel a plot for global domination by aliens with the US government's help. Well, help might be too strong of a word. In reality, the US government realizes that it's completely powerless to stop the aliens' plans, and instead attempts to go along with them in order to secure a better place for itself in the new alien-friendly world order. 
while also secretly trying to undermine said alien plans. It's a cloak and dagger show that explores the very fringes of real science and has no shortage of monsters. Yet, you may be surprised to learn that the real life FBI and CIA also have their very own, very real X Files. The Flying Saucer Swindler Silas M. Newton made a small fortune for himself in the first half of the 20th century thanks to his career in oil and natural gas. One of the hardest, most expensive parts of the oil business, however, is the exploration phase, with companies spending tens of millions of dollars just to find a suitable oil field to drill into. In the 1950s, though, Mr. Newton came up with a brilliant answer, and it might have been based on flying saucer technology. In 1950, the world was on fire with news of flying saucers. Just three years earlier, a mysterious crash in Roswell, New Mexico led to military officials making the shocking claim that a flying saucer from another world had been recovered. Just days later, though, the military reversed its statement, claiming no such saucer had crashed and instead a weather balloon had been recovered. The world wasn't buying it, and soon news of UFOs and alien bodies being recovered by the US government were all the rage. Then a bombshell announcement hit newspapers all across the US. Scientists says flying saucer pilots will land within a year. Little men in saucer do soon to explore Earth, Savant says. Geophysicist sees saucers landing soon, thinks pilots from other planet about ready to visit Earth. The story spread like wildfire fueled along with the credibility of the man behind the claims, a professional scientist. Only there was one problem. The scientist or geophysicist, as some papers called him, was none other than oil man Silas M. Newton, who definitely had no formal scientific training. Instead, given his knowledge of the oil business, it seems that one of the newspapers gave Mr. Newton an honorary degree and the rest sort of ran with it. As the story evolved, it was claimed that the predictions came from a real scientist named Dr. G, whom Newton was friends with. The scientist also claimed that the saucers flew using magnetic propulsion, utilizing the Earth's magnetic field to zoom around. Newton soon took things a step further and claimed that the same technology flying saucers were using he had learned to harness in a special device that could be used to detect oil. Unfortunately for Mr. Newton, the story had reached the desk of one J. Edgar Hoover, who, when he wasn't busy secretly cross-dressing or trying to dismantle the civil rights movement, occasionally took the time to do his job and investigate crime. Newton and his device were exposed as a hoax by the FBI, and Newton would end up facing prosecution for his elaborate flying saucer scam. Or at least that's the official story. After all, if Newton really had discovered world-changing tech based on flying saucers, surely the powers that be wouldn't want him to make it available on the free market. Our next X-File comes from the CIA and could truly have been out of this world. The Soviet UFO Incident July 1952 in the CIA station in West Germany receives a stunning report. A local may have just inadvertently stumbled upon a secret Soviet craft in the woods on the American-controlled West German countryside. The man is brought in for questioning as agents immediately move out to verify his story. The man is a 46-year-old German from East Germany and a former mayor, Oskar Linke. Linke has only just recently escaped from East Germany along with his wife and six children, and on the day in question is on his way home with his daughter when the tire on his motorcycle blows out. Unable to repair it, he and his daughter walk on foot to the nearest town, when suddenly his daughter points out something strange near the trees about 140 meters away from them, catching a glimpse of… something. Linka tells his daughter to wait and moves closer to get a better look. Once he's about 55 meters away, he spots what appears to be two men dressed in shiny metallic clothing, investigating something on the ground. Curious, Linka approaches the men and gets within 10 meters when he suddenly spots a large object on the other side of a small fence. The object appears to be a craft of some sort, something like a flying frying pan and about 13 to 15 meters in diameter. The top of the object is tapered so as to become a large conical tower. It was like nothing Linka or anyone else on this earth for that matter had ever seen. At that moment, Linka's daughter calls out to him, and the men in metallic suits whip around and realize they're being watched. They immediately climb inside the strange craft and disappear inside. The object begins to glow and rise into the air with a loud whistling sound, flames shooting out of the bottom of it as it lifts up and away over the trees. Linka was initially terrified that he'd stumbled across a secret Soviet craft, as he recalled in his testimony to CIA agents. He had known of people in East Germany that the Soviets had placed on travel restrictions for accidentally knowing too much. 
The CIA investigation into the matter revealed that at the exact same time as Linka's sighting, many other people in the area reported seeing a falling star-like object in the sky, with one shepherd noting that he had seen what he thought was a comet moving at a very low altitude over the forests. While this X-file is declassified, what's most telling is that the CIA's official conclusions on the matter are not, only the initial report. Whatever the CIA discovered after investigating the story and its conclusions on the origin of this mysterious craft remain to this day unknown. FBI's X-ray vision The 50s were apparently a pretty crazy time because our next X-file also comes from the 1950s. In 1957, two individuals from the federal government, whose names remain redacted in declassified papers, attended an event hosted by a Mr. William Foos at the American Legion headquarters in Washington, D.C. Mr. Foos made an extraordinary claim. He could teach the blind to see using extrasensory perception. At the demonstration, Mr. Foos used his own daughter, whom he blindfolded, and wowed the audience as she was able to read from newspapers brought by reporters, the Bible, and various other bits of literature. What's more, Mr. Foos's daughter was able to distinguish color and even move around the room without bumping into objects. After the demonstration was over, the two government agents questioned Mr. Foos privately, who revealed that he could teach the technique to others, that with some work, even greater feats could be accomplished, such as seeing through walls or into envelopes. The agents were so impressed by the event that they recommended the FBI look into Mr. Foos, citing the obvious benefits his abilities could be in counterintelligence and criminal investigation. What followed was a firestorm of federal, military, and even CIA investigation into Mr. Foos and others like him. While the demonstration by Mr. Foos's daughter was believed to be genuine, and no trickery could be determined by the agents who witnessed it, another demonstration by Mr. Foos's son, where he attempted to determine what specific card a face-down playing card was, saw only a 50% success rate, which was only a little bit better than when he attempted the same feat without a blindfold on. Officially, while not disproving Mr. Foos's abilities, the declassified FBI files show that they recommended the government not pursue Mr. Foos as a national security asset. However, what may be the most revealing about these files is one single line in one of the reports which states, the actuality of extrasensory perception has long been recognized, though not to the degree of perfection claimed by Mr. Foos. Perhaps Mr. Foos was officially discredited so that officially he could work for the U.S. government as an extrasensory spy, a phenomenon the FBI seemed to acknowledge was possible. Our next X-File comes from the CIA, which seems to reach some startling conclusions about what's really flying around in our skies. Flying Saucer Showdown in the Congo In the early 1950s, the threat of atomic war was very real, and both the U.S. and the Soviet Union took security of its precious uranium mines extremely seriously. That's why when two UFOs appeared over a uranium mine in the Belgian Congo, the CIA immediately leapt into action. For the start of its nuclear program, the U.S. sourced most of its uranium from mines in Belgian-controlled Congo, naturally leading to a CIA presence in the region. The threat of espionage or sabotage by Soviet agents was all too real, though the CIA desk in the Congo could have never expected a threat from outer space. On an unspecified day in 1952, two flying disks made an appearance over uranium mines over the southern Congo in the Elizabethville district. The disks were witnessed by dozens of observers on the ground and were seen to glide across the sky in elegant curves and change positions so frequently that from below they were seen as plates, ovals, and sometimes just lines as they turned edge on to the ground observers. Suddenly, before the shocked onlookers, the disks came to a complete stop and a hissing and buzzing sound was heard as the disks flew off in a zigzag flight toward the northeast. A Belgian military officer, identified as Commander Pierre, hopped onto a fighter plane and set off in immediate pursuit, taking off from a nearby airfield. He managed to come within 120 meters of one of the disks, estimating that the saucer had a diameter of 12 to 15 meters and was shaped like a discus. It had an inner core which seems to remain completely still while the outer part of the craft spun at incredible speed, being completely veiled in flame. Both crafts seemed to be constructed out of aluminum-like material. The UFOs flew together in an extremely precise manner, though Commander Pierre could not believe that the disks were manned as that incredible heat and sudden acceleration and deceleration would have no doubt killed any human occupant. The disks could make changes in elevation as great as 1,000 meters in just a matter of seconds, and they would often shoot down to skim just 20 meters above the tree line. Finally, the disks took off with a loud whistling sound at an estimated speed of 1,500 kilometers per hour, leaving Commander Pierre completely in the dust. 
Commander Pierre and his report were thoroughly investigated by the CIA, which concluded that Pierre was considered an extremely dependable officer and a well-trained and experienced pilot. While no further conclusions can be gleaned from the declassified document, one line at the end of the report clearly raises a lot of eyebrows. He gave a detailed report to his superiors, which strangely enough, in many respects agreed with the various results of research. Clearly, the CIA was inclined to believe Commander Pierre's statement on the flying saucers and his reported observations, as they seemed to closely match other eyewitness accounts investigated by CIA agents. Who was really flying those disks though we may never know, as any further conclusions remain classified. At the height of his powers, Pablo Escobar was raking in $149.5 million every single day. In today's money at least, that's $55.5 billion a year. As the famous anecdote goes, his cartel was going through $1,000 a week in rubber bands that went around the wads of cash. Escobar owned exquisite mansions, a fleet of luxury cars, and even a personal zoo featuring giraffes and hippos. But to get all those things like any law-breaking drug trafficker, he had to get his vast amount of mostly American money cleaned. As you'll see today, this is sometimes quite a complex operation and involves a lot of law-abiding friends. Let's stick with the deceased Mr. Escobar before we talk about the present state of money laundering for today's super-rich, technology-savvy criminals. We guess we should first explain a little bit about what money laundering actually is, for those of you unacquainted with the high crime. Basically, if you were a criminal earning millions of bucks from your highly illegal enterprise, you want to spend that money without someone asking questions. This is when money laundering comes in. Even smaller drug dealers these days will have a small front business, say a burger restaurant, so it'll look like they earn cash from a legitimate trade. All you have to do is do things that are inflating the prices so it looks like you've earned a legitimate profit. That's the real basic kind of money laundering. But when you're big, you need someone to wash your dirty cash in a complex system, hence the term laundering. You can't keep all that cash under your bed, and if you want to put it in the bank, you need to make it look as though it was earned through legal enterprise. You first get the money, then you can layer it by doing lots of small global transactions, perhaps buying stocks, or by using a shell company. After that, you integrate the money, meaning the money earned has come back to you to buy things with, but now it looks as if you earned the cash through legal means. Back in the day, the Colombian cartels didn't always use complex schemes. Those were the early days when law enforcement was lax and just about anyone could be bribed. In those days, the cartels would sometimes simply buy gold from Italy. They bought so much that they almost destabilized the price of gold there. The gold would then be smuggled back to Colombia, with some bribes on the way, no doubt. Then the cartels would sell the stuff to create legitimate money. Sometimes they simply sold it to Panama, but other times they smelted it and sold it to town mayors in Colombia. Those mayors then sold it to the state, saying that it came from local mines. Many years after Pablo Escobar met his end on a hot tin roof, the Sinaloa cartel would buy gold in the USA. They'd then sell it in the US, where someone would melt it down and sell it for hard cash. In this case, the melting guys in Florida would keep 1% of the earnings, which was still a lot. Sure, it meant falsifying lots of paperwork, but it worked. Well, it did, until it didn't. Gold is great for traffickers. In 2020, there were reports that one company based in Dubai was buying large amounts of gold from traffickers, and then that company was selling the gold to large US companies that used the precious substance for certain components and goods. So if you've ever used a product made by Apple, General Motors, or Amazon, and it has gold bits in it, you might have unwittingly helped those cartels. The company in Dubai denied doing it, but the DEA said it transferred tremendous amounts of illicit value through the use of gold as a commodity. The New York Times wrote about a vicious cycle that's been going on for years. The cycle goes drugs, gold, money, drugs, gold, money, and so on. The United States attorney then said that getting the drugs into the US was actually easier than getting the money out. You should know that when a large sum of money appears in a bank account, it can set off alarm bells. There was a guy in the UK who made a ton of cash from investing in virtual currencies, and then one day he found out that his account had been closed due to a flag of suspicious activity. He almost had a heart attack. But the bank hadn't taken the money, they gave him a check, and in the end he just had to go do his banking elsewhere. The tide of drugs and drug money never ends. It might get slightly interrupted, but the drug war is possibly the best example of Sisyphus pushing that ball a rock up a hill for an eternity. That's why drug traffickers have to keep evolving their laundering schemes just as the man you know as El Chapo did. While El Chapo was in his prime, he used an ingenious method to fly under the radar. A man named Hernán Botero Moreno came up with the idea of depositing less than $10,000 at a time and got the name Papa Smurf, hence the term Smurfing. He'd get what has been described as an army of Smurfs to deposit drug money in banks, but to avoid the bank issuing a suspicious activity report, the amount of cash was always under $10,000. Cute. 
But even with an army of people, it's not really that effective when you're talking about millions upon millions of dollars. El Chapo had many other tricks up his sleeves too. He'd do what's called trade-based money laundering, meaning he'd simply buy goods from companies with his drug money and sell the goods in Mexico for pesos. We're talking about a lot of goods. This can mean a company will knowingly take illicit cash or if they're unaware that they're dealing with extremely dodgy people. What the authorities will be doing meanwhile is looking for companies that have suddenly started selling way more than they did previously, or perhaps companies that have historically used money transfers but then suddenly changed to using large sums of cash instead. Let's give you a real example. El Chapo for a while was buying large amounts of clothes in LA's fashion district and some of those sellers were not reporting their transactions. This went on for a while with El Chapo selling the clothes in Mexico and only came undone because US banks started becoming suspicious when they saw the accounts of some of those sellers. But wouldn't you do the same given the opportunity? A cartel buying your goods in bulk can be a really good way of making money. So while this is a lot easier than you might have thought, the Cali and Medellin cartels used to do something even simpler. They used check cashing stores in New York City to get the money back to Colombia. And while you might think it wasn't that efficient, they sent $800 million back through this scheme before it was exposed. Banks can help too. When the cartel started making ridiculous amounts of money, they started putting it in banks in Miami, which led to alarm sounding after a while. The Federal Reserve Bank in Florida had a $5.5 billion cash surplus when all over the country there was a cash deficit. It turned out the banks involved were taking massive lump sums of cash and asking for very little documentation. They were found out through something called Operation Greenback. But don't go thinking that just because banks had been busted in the past, other banks didn't take huge amounts of cartel cash later. In 2006, a DC-9 jet landed down in Mexico where there was a bunch of soldiers waiting for it. When they checked the contents of the plane, they found around $100 million of cocaine. That was hardly a big deal. What was a big deal, though, was the evidence in the plane that showed the Sinaloa cartel had been laundering billions of bucks through a US bank. That bank was the Wachovia Bank, which would later become part of Wells Fargo. No one at the bank ever went to prison for the crime, although forfeiture and a fine in 2010 meant that the bank had to give the authorities a total of $160 million. That wasn't much, actually only 2% of the $12.3 billion the bank made in 2009. It's not as if the bank was friends with the cartels, or at least we don't think that was the case, but as the US media said, it showed a blatant disregard for our banking loss. The money was just too good. Here's what The Guardian had to say about this. More shocking, and more importantly, the bank was sanctioned for failing to apply the proper anti-laundering strictures to the transfer of $378.4 billion, a sum equivalent to one-third of Mexico's gross national product into dollar accounts from so-called casas de cambio CDCs in Mexico, currency exchange houses with which the bank did business. In this case, an English bloke working at the bank, Martin Woods, had spotted the suspicious accounts, but when he told his superiors something sketchy was happening, he got in trouble. He later took the bank to court and won a settlement for the unfair dismissal. He said of the bank's dealings with the cartels, these are the proceeds of murder and misery in Mexico and of drugs sold around the world, but no one goes to jail. And don't go thinking other banks didn't do it. With relatively small penalties and massive profits to make, you'd be a fool not to get involved. That usually just means turning a billion blind eyes. In fact, banks have been called the financial wing of the cartels. They're almost silent partners. In the words of Bob Dylan, steal a little, they throw you in jail. Steal a lot and they make you a king. Ask the British investment bank HSBC, which not that long ago was down on its knees saying, sorry, sorry guys, sorry, bad form old chap. That's because it was doing business with the largest drug cartel in the world and the bosses, it seemed, had given the accounts the blind eye treatment. It was obvious that it was cartel money, that's for sure. This was Wachovia Part 2, a bank, by the way, that monitored $376 billion of dodgy cartel cash. It's a lot of money going through your bank from people who sometimes do business with chainsaws and a pair of pliers. HSBC let $670 billion of cartel cash go through its systems without being monitored. The cartels even had special boxes made where they could dump huge amounts of cash right at the teller windows at HSBC outlets in Mexico. It ended up paying $1.256 billion in forfeiture as well as another $665 million. Where exactly all that money goes depends on various factors, but it usually just goes back to law enforcement, we guess, so they can carry on fighting the war on drugs. Sisyphus gets some new shoes, and he needs them. The war on drugs cost the US $51 billion per year and has cost well over $1 trillion over 50 years, although most of that money comes from the taxpayer. Anyway, you can't really beat having banks handle your cash and not ask questions. It's akin to the cops helping you get away with murder. And the best thing is, if you're a banker, you're too big to go to jail.
A former federal agent said it really bursts people's bubbles who think money laundering is always super complex. It sometimes isn't. That guy said in an interview, it's so simple, it's so unsophisticated. That is what to me is the most disturbing part of this. These guys are not even trying that hard. Take for example of the drug cartel that goes by the name of Los Zetas. They had a scheme in which they bought racing horses and used the profits to launder through the Bank of America. In this case, a US man connected to the gang did the banking. It was small change though, amounting to only one and a half million. Also in this case, the bank wasn't to blame so no fines were handed out. The thing with banks is they can say that they didn't know what was going on, but sometimes they really don't. That's why cartels will look for weak spots, meaning banks in some countries that don't have the highest grade mechanisms in place to spot suspicious movements of money. It goes without saying that the cartels are still doing it today. Sometimes they do what rich folks do who make their money legally, that is, store the money offshore where it can't be taxed. Regular companies do this by exploiting loopholes in the law, with royalty, big business, celebrities, and politicians getting in on the act. A modern example of this is in the case of a Mexican boss named Rafael Caro Quintero, whose incredibly expensive mansion was bought through an offshore account. By using such ghost accounts, the cartels can layer the money through many transactions. Some Chinese businessmen are in on the deal too due to it being a vast country with massive and intricate industries. The US media reports that China is actually the go-to place these days for cartels, where money laundering is said to be a complex issue. It was reported in one recent case that a large network of Chinese nationals were taking the drug money from the cartels by picking up large sums of it, often in the US. Then laundering was trade-based laundering that we talked about earlier, where the buying of goods is the name of the game. Just make it look like you're buying big from a business in China and that company will do a bit of what's called trade misinvoicing, and everyone's a winner. Not long ago, a Chinese national was arrested in the US for doing something called a mirror swap with the cartels. In this case, the broker took the drug money and then transferred that same amount of Chinese currency in their Chinese bank to a Chinese launderer. Money got swapped. And how did the US authorities track Chinese money? Not easily. The Chinese person who was caught in the act was under surveillance with the FBI hearing tapped telephone calls and the guy saying he was really worried about getting ripped off or even killed. He was handed $3 million over some time, which he had to send to someone else in China. He took a 3% commission. He probably shouldn't have worried about being killed since a good money launderer is a hot property. Some of the stranger ways to launder your cash is something you might have already thought about when you imagined becoming a criminal. What if you simply opened an account with an online gambling platform? That way you could keep the cash there and get it out using a variety of payment methods. You could also take the risk of gambling but only bet on safer kinds of bets such as what people sometimes call sure winners. Criminals have often used casinos in a similar way. Again, it's very basic. You go into a casino, you buy a large number of chips, then you play a bit and cash them in. This has been happening at casinos for years. As you have a receipt from the casino, it looks like you have clean money. Just in 2021, the media reported that a Chinese gang of launderers had been busted for cleaning millions of drug money for the cartels. They did some trade laundering, but they also sent money to a Chinese businessman who'd opened his own casino in Guatemala City. You can be sure having a casino working with you is an excellent way to get rid of your cash. In fact, many of the most recent reports feature Chinese nationals using casinos and also cryptocurrency to help the cartels clean their hard-earned blood money. When you purchase crypto, you do so with an identifying number, but you don't have to give your full name. Even though the blockchain where the transaction is recorded is there for the authorities to see, it's hard for them to track back the cash to a cartel. The criminals could have lots of accounts with different kinds of currencies, and they also use smurfs in the virtual world to handle their money. It's thought that the cartels have used cryptocurrencies to buy certain chemicals needed to make synthetic drugs made by Chinese companies. The word on the street is the cartels have moved around $3 billion through Chinese crypto exchanges, accounting for 50% of the crypto money they have. That analysis was from 2019, but you can be sure that this new way of laundering has taken off a lot more since then. The drug trade likely seems even more enticing than it did in the past, so we very much doubt that Sisyphus is going to retire anytime soon. As things stand, his sentence is still eternity. Scott Lee Kimball, a name you've likely never heard before today. Probably because the FBI doesn't want you to know about this serial killer they paid and protected. Kimball was born in 1966 to an unhappy home. He and his brother were witnesses to their parents' divorce when Kimball's mother came out as a lesbian shortly after his 10th birthday. His father immediately left her and remarried, but the boys went on to live with their mother. Deeply troubled by his home life, Kimball had his first run-in with the police when they were called after he fired a gun out of the window at neighboring homes. Kimball and his brother eventually moved in with their grandmother, but there, a neighbor, Theodore Payton, began bullying both of them. 
The bullying continued until Kimball's early 20s. Then he was involved in a gun accident that would change his life forever. The bullet glanced off his skull, leaving a distinct scar. The accident nonetheless left Kimball in critical condition for several days, but once he recovered, one of his cousins commented that he had changed dramatically. In his own words, he had lost his conscience. The trauma, however, gave Kimball the courage to face his bully, and he, along with several others, reported him to the police. Peyton would be convicted and imprisoned, but according to a former girlfriend, Kimball still felt like he was less of a man due to the bullying he suffered. The trauma had left deep scars, and the emotional and psychological damage would one day manifest itself in horrifying ways. Years later, an imprisoned Peyton was asked how he thought the bullying had shaped Kimball into the killer he would turn into, but Peyton had no comment. Kimball would make a living as a hunting guide and dabbled in numerous nonviolent crimes. In 1988, he scored his first felony for writing bad checks in Montana. Then later that year, he was arrested once more for passing yet another bad check and for breaking and entering in two separate homes and stealing several firearms. Kimball managed to avoid jail time and moved in with his second wife to Spokane, Washington, where he could start a new life of crime. Getting into the lumber business, he began to scam timber companies, almost as if he couldn't even help himself. Kimball also stole money from his wife's dentist and the church they attended. In 1997, the couple divorced, and two years later, Kimball kidnapped his wife, though charges were never filed because the two had continued a sexual relationship even after the split. Kimball's laundry list of crimes were finally catching up, and in 2000, he finally landed prison time. After passing three more forged checks, a court revoked his suspended sentence from his 1988 sentencing, landing him in prison for about a year. After his sentence, he was moved to a pre-release prison in Helena, Montana, where he was allowed to work as a cashier at a gas station. Inevitably, Kimball ended up stealing $671 from the gas station, along with a truck. Kimball fled north, going up to Alaska and living under his brother's name. There he met Catherine Curtis, the woman who would become his third wife and who never knew him as anyone but Brett Kimball. However, soon Kimball found himself in need of cash, and he bought himself blank check stock and a computer, with which he could print checks in his brother's name, forging almost $25,000 in bad checks. Eventually, the authorities once more caught up with him and they threw him in an Anchorage prison. Kimball knew that with all his old warrants surfacing now that his identity had been revealed. He'd need to make himself valuable somehow if he was going to be a free man anytime soon. That's when he turned to the FBI and sold them a story they bought hook, line, and sinker. Kimball might have been a monster, but he was charismatic and had a knack as a confidence man. He warned the FBI that his cellmate was plotting to kill a federal judge, federal prosecutor, and two witnesses. He also told them that he could provide information about the October 2001 assassination of a federal prosecutor in Seattle. Given his nonviolent white-collar crimes, the FBI bought his stories and discarded his warrants, moving him from his prison in Anchorage, Alaska to FCI Inglewood in Colorado. Six months later, he was released, officially an informant to the FBI. Of course, Kimball had no actual intelligence to provide for the FBI, so he fed them a continuous line of exaggerations and useless information. To this day, not a single arrest or warrant has ever stemmed from Kimball's service as an informant. Kimball, however, took right back to his old ways right under the FBI's nose. He began cashing bad checks again, but soon took on the biggest score of his life. He had started a legitimate business buying and selling organic beef and took to financing that business with bad checks. Getting greedy would lead to his downfall, though. Impersonating Cleve Armstrong, a local optometrist, Kimball wrote more than $83,000 in bad checks to his own companies. Kimball had gained access to the necessary info thanks to his mother, who ran an insurance company in the same building as Armstrong. Kimball had set up a small office for himself in the basement of the building, right next to a poorly secured closet that kept many of Armstrong's financial records. Breaking in and stealing the necessary info let Kimball impersonate Armstrong over the phone to his bank, making the payments without detection. As the police began to look for Kimball, though, he'd already fled the state. The FBI pulled their protection of Kimball after an internal review found that Kimball had provided no good intelligence to date. The officer who had recruited him and overseen his short career as an informant was immediately reassigned, probably to a listening post in the Arctic Circle somewhere. To this day, though, the FBI refuses to comment on the situation, likely to avoid even more public embarrassment. Kimball's marriage eventually imploded, and he took up with a 25-year-old waitress. She would later remark that while he acted like a gentleman at all times, he was prone to rough sex, bondage, and taking photos of her. Eventually, he pressured her to buy him a rifle, as he was not allowed due to his status as a felon. Upon receiving the rifle, Kimball disappeared once more. With the FBI now issuing a warrant for his arrest and cooperating with local law enforcement across several states, 
a disturbing picture of Kimball's activities in the last few years began to merge. Sometime toward the end of 2002, Kimball had reached out to Leanne Emery, the girlfriend of an inmate he had served time with and turned into authorities as the mastermind of an escape plan he had actually engineered himself. As part of the plan, his cellmate had told him to make contact with Emery once he was out of prison in case he wasn't able to, and Emery was also told to listen to Kimball and do as he said. Kimball contacted Emery and drew her into his scams, the two stealing mail from local post offices to forge checks. On January 16, 2003, Emery told her parents that she was going on a trip to Mexico to go caving. Her parents hoped that this was a sign she was taking some time off and getting a grip on her out-of-control life. Instead, she'd end up losing it. Emery and Kimball went on a road trip, stealing checks worth $15,000. Kimball also made sure that their gas and expenses were paid on Emery's credit card, as well as a laptop and a handgun. Kimball would use that handgun to shoot Emery in the head shortly after, leaving her body in a box canyon in Utah. Kimball would also go on to kill the girlfriend of another cellmate, Jennifer Markham. Markham was a 25-year-old single mother and high school dropout working as a stripper. Kimball had told Markham that he had opened up a chain of coffee shops and had an opening for her in Seattle. In preparation for the move, Markham moved her belongings to Kimball's home. She'd never be seen again. Markham's car was discovered at the Denver airport, though there was no evidence she had ever boarded a flight. On the insistence of her father, the police opened an investigation into Markham's disappearance, and through a contact at the FBI, he was able to get a meeting with an informant who had news on the murder and went by the alias Joe Snitch. The informant said that Jennifer was dead and knew where the body was buried, which made Markham's father believe that this informant had actually killed Markham himself. The FBI didn't believe him until Joe offered to show Markham's mother exactly what happened to her daughter or a sex escort if she paid for one. At a meeting, Markham's father had managed to write down Joe's license plate number and had a police friend run the plates, revealing that the informant was none other than Kimball himself. Kimball, however, had already struck close to home. In 2003, he had met a single mother, Laura McLeod, and now lived with his new girlfriend and her 19-year-old daughter, Casey Dawn McLeod. One day, Kimball presented a bag of drugs to Casey's mother, claiming to have found them in her room. In a confrontation with her mother, Casey grew angry after denying the drugs were hers and left the house. Kimball got Casey a hotel room where she could stay and came by to pick her up and drive her to work. He reassured Casey's mother that she just needed some time to cool off, but then Casey went missing. One day, she didn't show up at the hotel room, she was sharing with her boyfriend, and she had never shown up to work. Kimball claimed to have been on a hunting trip that day and conveniently left on a work trip for a whole week right after Casey went missing. Kimball had already murdered Casey, though, burying her remains in a national park. Casey wouldn't be the only family member Kimball would kill, though. Soon after Casey's disappearance, Kimball's uncle, Terry, had the good fortune of winning the lottery and promptly retired to Mexico. There was just one problem. The Ohio State Lottery had no record of Terry winning. What was known is that Kimball had immediately begun to sell Terry's items shortly after he went missing. In 2008, Kimball was finally jailed for check fraud and was the prime suspect in at least four disappearances. Authorities grilled him, but Kimball refused to confess to any murders though he dropped the enigmatic clue which stuck in one of the investigators' minds, asking what if one of the girls had simply disappeared in a national forest, presumably seeking to offer a plausible explanation for Casey's disappearance that didn't involve him. Kimball had inadvertently offered a clue that would bring him down. Investigator Jonathan Grusing happened to remember a receipt that had been sitting in evidence after Kimball's arrest. The receipt placed Kimball at a grocery store very near the Route National Forest on the day after Casey disappeared. Contacting park staff, they confirmed that a skull had been found in the fall of 2007. Subsequent DNA testing proved that it belonged to Casey McLeod. Perhaps the most disturbing of all, though, is the fact that Kimball had taken Casey's mother on their official honeymoon to that same forest, just a few days after he had killed and buried her, not far from where they made camp. With that discovery, the pressure ramped up on Kimball. He resisted at first, but eventually caved, helping lead investigators to the remains of two of his other victims. A third, however, couldn't be found but he admitted to the murder. Despite this, Kimball is suspected in the murders of several other individuals, including the attempted murder of his own son, covered up as a serious car accident. His son just happened to have a life insurance policy made out to Kimball himself. Today, Kimball rots in a prison in Florida where he'll never see another day as a free man. The FBI, meanwhile, continues to do its best to sweep under the rug the several years that they unknowingly protected a serial killer 
as an informant. It's the big day. You're about to become an official member of the Mafia. And once you're in, you don't get out. There's just one thing left to do. Go through your initiation rites. What does it truly take to become a member of the Mafia? The authorities have been trying to find out for a long time. The Mafia is a notoriously secretive crime organization, and many people who stumble onto information they shouldn't have don't live to tell anyone. But they're also a criminal organization with a respect for tradition and for hierarchy, and they take bringing new people into the organization seriously. So whether someone is an actual criminal or an undercover officer hoping to avoid detection, when it comes time for that initiation right, you'd better pay attention. But nothing stays a secret forever. The rituals date back a long time, all the way back to 1877 in Sicily, where it was written about in a local newspaper. Sixteen years later, things were tense between the local mafia, known as the Fratellanza, and the local left-wing youth group. Bernardino Vero, a young activist, joined the mafia's youth movement to gain their protection. He reported on the ritual he underwent, including tests of loyalty and cutting himself with a knife, with the blood that was then dripped onto the drawing of a skull. He soon broke from the Mafia and went on to a successful career as a local politician before the Mafia killed him, having not forgotten his past offenses. Many things have changed since then, but not everything. As the Mafia made their way across the ocean to America and established themselves as a criminal powerhouse, they became more tight-lipped than ever. Sharing details of the ritual with someone outside the mob was considered a grievous offense, with mob boss Joseph Massino saying, once a bullet leaves that gun, you never never talk about it. The irony of that statement, he was saying it from the witness stand after turning on the mafia and cutting deals with the government. Today, much more is known about the ritual thanks to the number of made men who have flipped, and it all started with the FBI. The year was 1989, and the mystery was about to be blown wide open. It was suburban Boston, and the Patriarca family was inducting new members. Needless to say, this was by invitation only, and getting rejected at the door would mean harsher consequences than getting tossed out by the bouncer. The FBI couldn't get in, but that didn't mean they weren't prepared. They placed electronic surveillance devices at the house before the big day and captured the identities of everyone present, along with the details of a ritual that few outside the Mafia had ever glimpsed. And there was one big advantage to this. It's not illegal to be inducted into the Mafia, and no one was busted for it. The FBI kept tabs on all the new guys, of course, but the biggest reason cracking the initiation right was a coup for the feds was when working with undercover agents. If you're in deep cover with the Mafia and it's your time for your initiation right, you better get every step of it right, or you might be headed for a quick retirement with two shots to the back of the head in a swamp. Knowing and even watching the initiation right ahead of time could give future undercover agents the chance to prepare themselves and project the confidence an undercover man needs. In the United States, a few things have changed, but the core stays the same. The Mafia knew that the heat was on, and for a while the books to become a made man in the Mafia were closed, for almost 20 years. While the FBI had information and eventually a first-hand perspective, the first description came from old-school Mafia man turned government informant Joe Convicted of trafficking and murder, he turned government witness in the 1960s and provided the FBI with the most detailed information on the Mafia yet, including the nitty-gritty of the ceremony. The first step, getting chosen. How do you join the Mafia exactly? There isn't an application process, and pushing too hard will probably make the local bosses think you're suspicious. In other words, you don't call them, they'll call you. The best way to get in is to show them you can be trusted. People who run errands for Mafia members offer them a legitimate place to do business or cover for them with the authorities will be on their radar, and they may eventually go from an associate to a full-on member. They'll also bring in solo criminals who impress them with their ingenuity, although you don't want to be seen as competition. And once you get in, it's serious business. You'll meet the bosses, and they have to approve you. Once you get the nod, it's common for multiple people to be initiated at one time, in a sort of collective baptism into the world of crime. This is where you become a wise guy, or in the more famous term, a made man. Well, kind of. Getting initiated isn't the end of the story, but it is one of the biggest steps to make the bosses trust you. They want to see loyalty. They want to see confidence, so they're going to put you through the paces and you'd better not flinch, even when there's some pain involved. Joe Vallaki's description of the ceremony might not be 100% accurate anymore from the 1960s, but the majority has stayed consistent. He sat down at the table and was presented with some wine, along with a gun and a knife. The boss said some words in Italian, and another wise guy picked up Vallaki's hand and pricked his finger, dripping the blood onto a piece of paper. The paper usually has an image of a skull or a saint on it. The boss then informed Vallaki that he was now part of the family and he would now live by the gun and the knife and die by them as well. But is this truly what it takes to become a made man? The definition differs, but the practice remains, and becoming a full-fledged member of the Mafia might have little more to it than just that ritual. For one thing, there's a condition that you can't fake. Most Italian Mafia groups require anyone involved to be Italian or have Italian background and be sponsored by another made man, so a Dutch criminal might be out of luck. They also have to take the Oath of Omerta, a code of silence and honor that represents the Mafia's values. They then become 
become an official soldier in the Mafia. But is there another deadlier requirement for joining the Mafia? It's been a persistent rumor about the Mafia for decades, and it frequently makes its way into Hollywood portrayals. Do you truly have to kill someone to become a fully made man? It used to be a requirement to commit a contract killing to become eligible, both to show loyalty and to weed out any undercover officers who wouldn't be willing to go that far. No killings for personal reasons were allowed, so the victim was usually an enemy of the Mafia or a member of the family who had betrayed them or screwed up badly enough to earn a permanent retirement. But this bloody tradition might be dying out. Forcing a new soldier to earn their bones with a killing might be a good way to prove loyalty, but it's also messy and attracts attention. Back in Sicily and in the old days when the Mafia had infiltrated law enforcement and government, they could get away with it and cover up the bodies, so having the tradition was worth it. But now, with the FBI and local government on their trail and the Mafia at only a fraction of its old strength, forget about it. Killing someone every time a new soldier joins the Mafia would paint a giant target on their back. And once you're in, you'd better be ready to abide by the code of conduct. A made man has some simple rules to follow, starting with the most important, be loyal. The Mafia takes loyalty and secrecy seriously, and interfering with the Syndicate's interests or informing on them is the quickest way to a fast and brutal exit. The Mafia also commands its members to be rational and not pick fights they can't win, to be a man of honor who respects women and the chain of command, and to represent the Mafia well. This means showing class, independence, and courage. Well, as much of these traits as any member of a crime syndicate can show. But the Mafia does have standards many criminals don't. For one thing, the Mafia is looking for a specific type of criminal. They don't want loose cannons who seem to be in the game only for the pleasure and cause more damage than they need to. That was what disqualified Mad Sam DiStefano from joining the Chicago mob. The brutal loan shark loved to kidnap, torture, and kill people and was frequently used by the mob as a feared enforcer. But his sadistic Lee, as well as the rumors that he worshipped the devil, meant the Mafia was never willing to bring him in as a full member. For one thing, DiStefano was too unpredictable, and they didn't trust him to keep their secrets. And sometimes it's not who you are, it's who you know. Another group of people is never going to get to see that sacred Mafia initiation rite, anyone who's too close to a police officer. Police officers are immediately disqualified, of course, because the temptation to play both sides would be too much. Anyone who has attended or applied to law enforcement is out, and many times the Mafia will shy away from anyone who has too many families in the business. Of course, rules are meant to be broken, and quite a few Mafia bosses have brought in corrupt police or corrections officers because they have useful connections that can give the Mafia an edge in their district. And once you do manage to take that initiation right, you better take the blood oath seriously. It's one of the most common tropes in Mafia movies. The made man failed his boss, and he's taken off to be snuffed out for humiliating the family. Is it actually true? Well, as usual, Hollywood is taking some liberties. An organization that killed off its soldiers at the first mistake would likely have a pretty hard time with recruitment. But there are certain offenses that will get you a 22 caliber exit from the Mafia. These include killing or making an attempt on the life of a fellow made man, committing crimes against the code of the Mafia, or stealing from the Mafia. But what about those most notorious Mafia criminals, the Dirty Rats? Does everyone who testifies against the Mafia have a target on their back? It's certainly a concern, because a good number of people in the Witness Protection Program testified against organized crime syndicates. But the FBI knows how to cover up people's identities, and it's rare for anyone in the program to actually be discovered and targeted, unless they let themselves be known. But even some turncoat mafiosos who did go public, like Sammy the Bull Gravano, went on to leave the program and write books about their time in the Mafia and survived, although they rarely managed to stay out of legal trouble. And as the secrets were exposed, the organization evolved. The government knows more about how the Mafia functions than ever before, and the crime syndicate has had to change its ways. While it used to be an incredibly insular group, it now works more with other ethnic mobs, particularly the Russian Mafia, along with some notorious motorcycle gangs. The Mafia is dialed back, serving as the enforcer for its own criminal business, often letting other partners take the heat and dish out the brutality. They have a mix of legal and illegal businesses that make it easier to confuse the authorities and cover their dealings up. And in one big way, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. Once the first Mafia member testified before Congress, the code of Omerta would never be the same. While the Mafia still strongly discourages anyone sharing their secrets, it's become commonplace to take deals when arrested by the feds. Not only are the foot soldiers taking deals when they need to, but some of the most prominent bosses have tried to avoid harsh penalties by spilling everything to the government, and that's created quite a few vacancies that the underbosses are happy to fill. And yes, they're still taking new members. But remember, don't call them, they'll call you. And when you get that call, you better be ready to shed a little blood for your new family. The FBI has gone after some of the most notorious targets around. Spies, terrorists, assassins, and a magazine publisher. Why would the FBI go after Hugh Hefner? And how did this result in a body count? Of course, Hugh Hefner was no ordinary magazine publisher. He was one of the most famous and infamous figures in the 20th century America. And the legendary dirty old man was equally loved and hated. 
For most people who knew him, he was a larger-than-life man who lived in a massive mansion surrounded by beautiful, much younger women nicknamed Bunnies. He was primarily associated with one word, both the title of his most famous creation and the word that epitomized his lifestyle, Playboy. But he didn't start out as a legend of controversy. Everyone has to start somewhere, and Hefner grew up in a normal Midwestern household and was raised Methodist. His mother even wanted him to become a missionary, but Uncle Sam came calling instead. In the 1940s, he served in the army as a writer for a military newspaper. That kicked off his passion for writing and journalism, and he went to college and later started at the bottom of the magazine world, working as a copywriter for Esquire. He believed in his dream, but Esquire didn't quite agree. They denied him a $5 raise, so he quit and in 1952. It would be one of the biggest butterfly effect moments in the history of journalism. Hefner had a dream, and he took out a loan and investments to launch his own magazine. One of those investments was from his own devout mother, who didn't like the idea but believed in her son's dream anyway. With 8000 bucks, he kicked off a magazine initially planned to be called Stag Party, but instead he wisely named it Playboy. With the intention of it being a classy gentleman's magazine, it would have journalism, glamour shots, lifestyle tips, and of course some revealing photos of the most beautiful women in the world. And the first issue's cover star? None other than Marilyn Monroe. And it would turn Hugh Hefner into a legend. Gentlemen prefer blondes? That was definitely the case here, with Monroe helping turn the magazine into a huge hit. Her centerfold image was a nude study of the superstar taken for the calendar, and it soon made the magazine a household name. While it was the playmate of the month, the lady on the cover and in the centerfold that got people talking, the magazine was quickly gaining reputation as a place for top-tier journalism and literature. It serialized the iconic anti-censorship thriller Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury a year after its release, bringing it to a much bigger audience. And what surprised many people was the magazine's political bent. If you had to guess Hefner's political leaning, what would you guess? Many people today would guess the creator of Playboy was your typical knuckle-dragging misogynist. After all, the magazine was largely about sexy ladies and seemed to appeal to your man's man types. No doubt many men assumed Hefner was one of them, but those men were shocked when he debuted his Playboy philosophy column in the 1960s. This was where Hefner could express his views, and he became a fierce defender not just of free speech, but of women's rights and LGBTQ rights. He was also a big fan of cannabis and became one of the first prominent activists for legalizing weed. And this was when he started making powerful enemies. Those enemies included a diverse coalition. Feminists burned copies of Playboy at protests, holding his gentleman's magazine genre responsible for more extreme spin-offs like Penthouse and Hustler. Meanwhile, the neo-Nazi leader, George Lincoln Rockwell, was infuriated when Hefner tricked him into being interviewed by a black man. And in 1963, Hefner was even arrested for a particularly racy centerfold and put on trial for obscenity. The jury couldn't reach a conclusion, the government opted not to retry the case, and Hefner walked away free. But once you wind up on the government's radar, you usually stay there. The FBI had been after Hefner for some time, creating a file on the Playboy creator and trying to find evidence of criminal conduct from his empire. When a federal indictment comes down, it's very rare for the defendant to get off, so Hefner no doubt felt like he had a sword of Damocles hanging over his head. They investigated every corner of his empire, particularly the goings-on at the Playboy mansion. But while they found plenty of evidence of debauchery, what they didn't find was any rock-solid evidence of crime. No drugs, no sex trafficking. If Hefner was a criminal, he was a very good one, but the government rarely took no for an answer. Over time, Hefner's FBI file ballooned to 58 pages and contained multiple lines of investigation. Declassified in 2019, it showed that he'd been interviewed several times in the 1950s and 1960s over possibly transporting obscene material over state lines. When that came up empty because Hefner knew his way around the local laws, they moved on to try to find informants that would implicate him. Hefner had many people in his circle, and they just had to find the right one who knew the dirty details on him. And one woman gave them their opening. Her name was Bobby Arnstein, and she was one of the women closest to Hefner, but she wasn't one of his bunnies. She was Hefner's personal assistant, and she was one of the people he trusted most on business matters. But she also was a questionable judge of character, and she had powerful men leading her down the wrong path. But that powerful man wasn't Hefner, it was her boyfriend, Ron Scharf. And that gave the FBI their opening. When the FBI descended on the Playboy Mansion in 1974, the man known as Hef no doubt thought his enemies were after him again. But they weren't this time, instead they descended on Arnstein and arrested her like a dangerous criminal. They had previously cornered one of Scharf's associates, George Matthews, and offered him a lighter sentence on his own drug charges in exchange for implicating Arnstein. He was more than happy to cooperate, 
and they arrested both Scharf and Armstein. When she was searched, they found a small amount of cocaine on her body, half a pound, which is well below the amount that a high-level trafficker would carry. But the FBI had what they needed. Arnstein was arrested for drug trafficking and was considered an active participant in Scharf's criminal enterprise, which meant she was facing heavy jail time. But the FBI didn't care about her, they cared about Hugh Hefner, and they assumed that her proximity would give her information, and the prospect of spending many years in prison would make her say anything they wanted her to say. But they were wrong. It's possible that Arnstein just had nothing to tell. Maybe Hef was actually squeaky clean, but she was also fiercely loyal. She was unwilling to cut a deal with the FBI and essentially told them to do their worst. So that's exactly what they did. Arnstein was put on trial and the FBI wasted no time making an example out of her. Scharf, accused of being the mastermind of the ring, got six years in prison, while Arnstein was convicted of harsher charges and was given a life-ruining sentence of 15 years in federal prison. Even with this sentence hanging over her, she made no moves toward turning state's evidence and withdrew from the public eye as she awaited the deadline to turn herself in to serve her time. And things were going from bad to worse for Playboy and Hefner. Hefner's pride and joy was mired in scandal at the time, including a racial discrimination lawsuit, an IRS audit, and now a massive collection of headlines associating Hefner's close associate with a drug trafficking ring. Hefner had even wound up on Richard Nixon's enemies list, which might be a compliment depending on how you feel about old Tricky Dick. But no doubt, many people expected Arnstein to strike the killing blow against Playboy by eventually giving in to the FBI's pressure and testifying against him. Instead, Hefner would be hit by a very different blow. Arnstein had been allowed to leave prison while her appeal was pending, but the odds weren't looking good. She was then informed by a U.S. attorney that there was a hit out on her life, but no one knew if it was real. She went back to the mansion, but she and everyone else started to get scared about what would happen in the future. Hefner obsessively searched the mansion for drugs that might have been planted there, but Arnstein increasingly withdrew from the luxurious world Hefner built. When she next appeared in the headlines, it would be for a very different reason. It was January 19, 1975. Arnstein had checked into a hotel room in Chicago, and when she didn't leave her hotel room one morning, people became suspicious. She wasn't answering the door, and when the room was opened, they found her dead. She had left a note behind, and an autopsy would reveal that she had taken too many pills. Whatever Hefner's secrets were, she had taken them with her to the grave. The note she left behind backed that up. It was a quick but forceful statement that Hefner was a moral man who had never been involved in criminal activity and accused the government of pursuing and harassing him without cause. Did the FBI's crusade now have a body count? Until Arnstein's death, Hefner was largely up against the ropes when it came to the government. Most people, except those who read Playboy, assumed the colorful Hefner had to be involved in something shady. The government had been after him a long time, but now a woman was dead and her funeral was the first Hefner ever attended. He was seen to be genuinely grieving, and this humanized him in the eyes of many people. Journalists took his side against the government, especially since the Nixon administration was now disgraced itself. But that didn't protect Playboy from the fallout. Maybe it was just the association with the accused drug trafficker. Maybe it was because people realized the government meant business and any of them could be in the crosshairs next. But people started distancing themselves from Playboy hard. Originally, board members left the company and the stocks dropped quickly. It seemed like the mighty Playboy empire might be on the ropes. But Hefner wasn't done fighting because he was fighting hard and he wanted to cause some damage to the government. He held a press conference, seemingly shaken, enraged, and more human than anyone had ever seen him. He accused U.S. Attorney Jim Thompson, the man behind the case, of causing Arnstein's death. And many people agreed with him. As more details came out, the FBI tried to paint the picture of Arnstein as an emotionally unstable individual. Maybe she was, but it didn't counter any of Hefner's points. They had never proven that she was anything but a player in Sharp's schemes, and it was pretty clear they targeted her as a way to get to Hefner, with tragic consequences. But some thought the probe might have done its job anyway. Was there any way for the famous nudie mag to survive being in the government's crosshairs for so long? It turned out the answer was yes. Two things happened soon after the affair began. Nixon was forced to resign in disgrace over the Watergate scandal, and his successor, Gerald Ford, was much less inclined to target his enemies. Hefner took a step back from running Playboy and made his daughter, Christy, his assistant. She helped the company's image and improved its standing with women and doubled down on the journalistic elements of the magazine. And it worked, because Christy stayed with the company for over 30 years. Hefner, meanwhile, never went to jail and died at the Playboy mansion at the ripe old age of 91, having become more of a lovable, dirty old man mascot for the company by the end. The FBI is a government agency supposedly intended to protect American civilians from the worst criminals imaginable, from domestic terrorists to serial killers. But who do you run to when the FBI wants you dead?
It may seem like the high concept premise of the latest Jason Bourne movie, but this was actually the terrifying reality faced by a number of political leaders and public figures as a result of COINTEL PRO, the FBI's clandestine series of projects intended to bring American activism to its knees. But what was COINTEL PRO really? When did it happen? Who were its targets? And what terrifying illegal methods were employed under its purview? There's only one way to find out. But be warned, by the time this video is over, the FBI won't seem like the brave crime stoppers the movies often paint them as. Under COINTEL PRO, which stands for Counterintelligence Program, they were responsible for everything from psychological warfare to cold-blooded murder, all committed against mostly non-violent individuals whose greatest crime was questioning the system. Just how far the system will go to silence these questions will alarm and terrify you. And at the heart of it all was FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who opened a nightmarish Pandora's box of government overreach and illegal domestic espionage. The year is 1956, and the Red Scare is in full swing. You don't need to be an expert in American political history to know that mid-1950s America was terrified of communism. The threat of the bomb loomed large over American psyches, and Soviet spies and sleeper agents seemed to lurk in every shadow. Russia and the West were fighting a culture war, and the US was scared it was losing. When someone is afraid and backed into a corner, there's almost nothing they won't do to protect themselves, whether the initial fear is justified or not. The US needed bold strategies to fight the perceived communist threat growing within their own borders, and J. Edgar Hoover was on the case. He gave his underlings a sweeping directive to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize any political groups deemed too submersive for the FBI's liking. Hoover had the tacit permission of President Eisenhower and soon after President Kennedy, and Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy personally signed off on a number of covert projects under the COINTELPRO banner. Of course, while every sinister government project requires some enabling bureaucrats to sign all the permission slips, there always needs to be some trigger men willing to get their hands dirty and get the dastardly job done. In this case, we have William C. Sullivan, director of the FBI's domestic intelligence operations. Sullivan's first target was the Communist Party of America, who, on name alone, were obviously no friends of the Cold War FBI. Some of the techniques used by the FBI to destroy the Communist Party from the inside, including having agents sending threatening anonymous phone calls, having the IRS constantly audit them, and sending in forged documents to sow dissent among the party's ranks. You'll come to notice that this is a running theme among the COINTELPRO projects, using psychological warfare tactics to turn groups against each other and alienate their members. To this end, literally nothing was off the table, FBI agents infiltrating meetings and posing as members to cause conflict, intelligence gathering for blackmail and extortion, and even spreading rumors to increase the tension. Though compared to just how horrific and violent their methods would later become, some blackmail mail and rumor spreading is pretty quaint. While the Communist Party was a perfect training ground for refining their domestic espionage techniques, the activities that would make COINTELPRO infamous were perpetrated against civil rights groups, starting in the late 50s and continuing through the 60s. Dr. T. R. M. Howard, a prominent black surgeon, entrepreneur, and civil rights leader, was critical of the FBI's inaction on a number of infamous hate crimes, including the murders of Emmett Till and George Washington Lee. This prompted Hoover to turn the dangerous attentions of Sullivan and his FBI cronies to black civil rights groups, starting with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, on the grounds that they were supposedly hotbeds of subversive communist activity. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was just the tip of the iceberg, though. During their 15-year heyday, COINTELPRO would infiltrate and attack the Black Panther Party, anti-Vietnam War organizers, feminist groups, environmentalist and animal rights groups, the Nation of Islam, the Young Lords Puerto Rico Independence Group, and the American Indian Movement. In their very minor defense, they also did take on the Ku Klux Klan, but when you need to compare yourself to the Klan to have moral high ground, you're not doing well. Perhaps their most infamous victims were two of the most well-known civil rights leaders in American history, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. It all gets a whole lot worse from here. In 1963, Dr. King gave his iconic I Have a Dream speech during the March on Washington, while generations of people across the world were touched and inspired by this incredible piece of history, the FBI were terrified. Dr. King was dreaming too big for their liking, and they wanted to put him in his place, that place being six feet below the ground. Hoover ordered Sullivan to turn his attention to discrediting and destroying King and the movement he'd come to represent. 
Sullivan subsequently released a horrifically racist statement. In the light of King's powerful demagogic speech, we must mark him now if we've not done so before as the most dangerous Negro of the future in this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro and national security. The espionage began. King's home and hotel rooms were bugged, and his phones were tapped. The FBI was listening intently to his every word for blackmail material that they could use to silence King. You're probably asking, silence him? As in pressure him into discontinuing activism and renouncing his beliefs? To which we'd answer, no. They wanted Dr. King to kill himself. In 1964, after years of collecting audio evidence of Dr. King's marital affairs, King was sent a suicide package two days before he was supposed to collect his Nobel Peace Prize. The package included copies of the incriminating audio, as well as a truly horrifying letter. The letter, while anonymous, is believed to some to have been written by Sullivan himself. It's a verbally abusive speech that opens with King. In view of your low-grade, abnormal personal behavior, I will not dignify your name with either a Mr. or Reverend or a Doctor, and your last name calls to mind only the type of King such as King Henry VIII and his countless acts of adultery and immoral conduct lower than that of a beast. The letter almost reads like the cruelest internet comment you've ever seen, complete with a plethora of personal insults and spelling errors. And much like an internet troll with a serious mean streak, the letter ends by attempting to pressure Dr. King into committing suicide. It reads, King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do. This exact number has been selected for a specific reason, and it has a definite practical significance. You are done. There is but one way out for you. You better take it before your filthy, abnormal, fraudulent self is bared to the nation. While for legal reasons they stop just short of saying straight up, kill yourself or we'll humiliate you, the implications are crystal clear. When King didn't give in and take his own life, Cartha Deloach, the FBI assistant director at the time, began leaking the incriminating evidence to every news outlet imaginable. They were ruthless in their willingness to destroy reputations and lives to achieve their goals, but things were going to get a whole lot worse. While they were trying to manipulate Dr. King into taking his own life, the FBI were stoking the fires of tension among the Nation of Islam and the Organization of Afro-American Unity, both known for their association with civil rights leader El Haj Malik El Shabazz, better known as Malcolm X. Through COINTELPRO, the FBI widened the rift between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam. After a sustained harassment campaign involving infiltration, rumor mongering, and the artificial elevation of conflict, the disagreements of Malcolm X and Muhammad turned deadly, and Malcolm X was assassinated by some Nation of Islam gunmen. While the FBI denied direct involvement in the assassination, there's extremely credible evidence that their involvement in exacerbating the conflict led to the murder. As the 1960s drew on, the FBI intensified its COINTELPRO operations against prominent civil rights groups, Dr. King and his associates in particular. This project was known as COINTELPRO Black Hate. According to a 1968 FBI memo, they feared that Martin Luther King Jr. was becoming a kind of messiah figure and would unite the various disparate civil rights groups into a force that could truly be reckoned with. If Dr. King ever decided to reject nonviolence and lead to an armed revolt, they would be in serious trouble. King was public enemy number one, but prominent members of groups like the Black Panthers weren't far behind. All of them had to go. The FBI concluded with numerous police departments in cities with considerable Black Panther presences, including San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Philadelphia, and Chicago. They would coordinate raids into the homes of Black Panther members without warrants, during which many of said members were shot dead by police. One particularly infamous example is the assassination of Chicago Black Panther Party Chairman Fred Hampton. On December 4, 1969, Hampton was drugged and incapacitated by deep cover FBI infiltrator William O'Neill. A Chicago PD tactical unit then entered his home at the FBI's behest and murdered Hampton in his bed in cold blood. No crime was too cruel and no tactic was too underhanded for COINTELPRO. With the help of colluding police departments, the FBI was able to launch a brutal harassment campaign against figures in the world of leftist politics and civil rights. Specific individuals like Elmer Geronimo Pratt, a Black Panther Party leader, were accused of crimes they didn't commit and arrested on false pretenses. Evidence was falsified, witnesses were intimidated, and legality was twisted to serve whatever purpose the FBI wanted it to. Pratt spent 27 years in jail for a fallacious murder charge just because he was a member of the Panthers. Members of the KKK, like Gary Thomas Rowe, were kept on the FBI payroll as informants while still committing atrocities like the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing. And this wasn't an isolated incident. 
Under COINTELPRO, it was clear that the FBI preferred hardline white supremacist groups to black liberation movements. They funded and supported former members of the 1960s far-right group the Minutemen in their goal to create this secret army organization, essentially a militant terrorist cell that fought against civil rights groups with tactics of intimidation and outright violence. Hundreds if not thousands of potential enemies of the FBI were spied on with everything from wiretaps to direct stalking techniques. They even teamed up with the CIA in 1967 as part of their own domestic spying project, Operation Chaos. The COINTELPRO reign of terror would consume the whole decade, a decade mostly known for flower power, free love, and imported British rock. The whole program was so sprawling that even figures like James Baldwin, Ernest Hemingway, and Muhammad Ali were on their list of enemies. Incidentally, Muhammad Ali ended up being a major force in the end of the COINTELPRO operations, as his 1971 fight with Joe Frazier acted as a form of cover, while activist groups Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI broke into an FBI field office in Pennsylvania. The group stole critical files on the COINTELPRO operations and blew the lid on the whole sordid affair, leading to considerable scandals and shame for the FBI and the public eye. Within a year, J. Edgar Hoover had announced that centralized COINTELPRO operations were officially over. And while the FBI has hardly been squeaky clean since, the dissolution of the centralized COINTELPRO operations was an undeniable win for anyone who likes the idea of living in a truly free country. Of course, only a fraction of the files were stolen, and many of the files subsequently released by the FBI have been heavily altered and redacted. The fact is, we will never know the full extent of the FBI's sinister activities between 1956 and 1971. But what we do know is that the FBI activities under the COINTELPRO umbrella were some of the most terrifying and illegal in American history. Groups who were simply exercising their quintessentially American First Amendment rights were attacked, defamed, arrested, and dissolved. And the people who formed these groups were at best threatened and manipulated, and at worst murdered and pressured toward suicide. We wish we could give you a more comforting ending, but instead, we'll leave you with two questions. What are the chances that COINTELPRO was an isolated incident? And what else have the FBI done that we don't even know about? This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh makes cooking at home fun, easy, and affordable. Get mouth-watering seasonal recipes and fresh pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. And HelloFresh is my personal number one meal kit too. Not only are their meals the most delicious of any meal kit service I've tried, I mean, come on, just look at these salsa verde enchiladas, but HelloFresh is also helping me meet my goal of cooking at home more often. It can be hard after a busy day trying to figure out what to make for dinner, which is when I usually turn to takeout or expensive delivery services. But it's easy to stay on track when there's 50 weekly options to choose from, each with pre-portioned ingredients that remove basically all the meal prep. And no more after-work runs to the grocery store either. Not only are you saving on gas, but nearly all of the HelloFresh packaging is recyclable. It's no wonder that they're the first carbon-neutral meal kit company. And if that wasn't enough, they've also partnered with Plastic Bank to prevent 10 million plastic bottles from entering the ocean each year. Delicious and ethically responsible? What more can you ask for? So what are you waiting for? Use my link or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POGINFOGRAPH16 for up to 16 free meals plus 3 surprise gifts across 6 HelloFresh boxes plus free shipping. Wouldn't it be great to win any argument? Well, now you can. Certain FBI negotiation techniques can make you successful at talking down confrontation and getting what you want. The surprising thing is that these are strategies you can use in any situation, whether you're trying to get a raise from your boss or attempting to persuade a friend that you're right. These techniques will make all the difference. If these tactics are good enough in hostage situations, they are good enough for your daily life. The first and perhaps most important thing to recognize before using any of these techniques is that you're actually in a negotiation situation. You may think you're having a normal discussion with someone when in reality, you're negotiating for what you want. FBI experts warn the most dangerous negotiations are the ones you don't know you're in. There are some keywords to listen for and then leverage in order to choose which tactic from this video will work best. If you hear words like I want, I need, or will you come out of someone's mouth, that means they're negotiating and it's time to bring out the big guns. The trick is that once you realize you're in this situation, you need to get into the right mindset. During any negotiation, FBI agents are taught to remain calm, keep a level head no matter what happens, and if you lose control of your emotions during negotiation, the other person has already won. According to the FBI, you also need to remember that negotiations go both ways. You may not get everything you want. 
and you may have to concede a bit in order to get some of what you want or no one will win. Negotiations are different than ultimatums in that there are ways for both sides to get something they want. Even in high-stakes circumstances, there doesn't have to be just one winner. It is once you accept that you're in the negotiation that it's time to adjust the way you think and how you're going to proceed from here on out. You need to ask yourself, what does the other person want and why? Once you're at this stage, take a deep breath and follow the expert advice divulged by FBI agents on how to get what you want out of the negotiation. This first technique might seem pretty obvious. However, the crazy part is that FBI negotiators were told not to do this for a long time. Then everything changed. Negotiators need to keep their emotions in check, but recent research has found that emotions in a negotiation can actually be beneficial to your cause. A good negotiation never ignores the emotions of the person they're talking to, and they certainly don't ignore their own. This should be the case when you're negotiating as well. By leveraging the emotions of the person you're talking to, you can find ways to connect with them, show them empathy, and work toward a solution. But in order to do this, FBI negotiators reiterate that you need to recognize and accept the emotions present and not repress them. It's recommended that whenever you're in a discussion with someone, you always need to watch, listen, and analyze what they're doing and feeling. In this sense, one of the best pieces of advice FBI negotiators give is to keep your mouth shut as much as possible because the more someone talks, the more likely they'll be to make a mistake or divulge information that you can use later on. But this tactic isn't just for high-pressure situations in the field. You can use it in your own life as well. Oftentimes, in relationships, there are decisions that two people disagree over. Rather than letting this disagreement build up into an argument, there might be a way to defuse the situation and come to a decision using the embracing of emotions FBI negotiators recommend. If you find yourself disagreeing with someone or getting agitated, it's important to recognize that and step back from that negative emotion. The same can be said for the person you're negotiating with. If you notice anger starting to arise in the other party, you'll want to move quickly to one of the next techniques to help redirect the conversation to a more productive path. There are concrete techniques that the FBI uses when trying to make the other person feel like they're being heard. This can allow them to keep tensions down and move the conversation toward the desired outcome. One of the most powerful tools they use to do this is selectively mirroring the words of the opposite party. This strategy is used by FBI negotiators pretty frequently. How it works is that when the person you're negotiating with is done speaking, you repeat the last one to three words they just said. This is one way to show you're listening to them and their side of the argument. But there's another reason to mirror words. FBI agents have found that mirroring the last few words of the person they're negotiating with allows them to establish rapport with the other person. This is true both if you already know the person or are meeting them for the first time. Mirroring their words causes them to lower their guard slightly and feel safer divulging more information. Not only does the mirroring technique help build a rapport, but it also slows the conversation down. No matter how good you are negotiating, you always need time to think. Mirroring does not take a lot of effort and allows you to think while also building trust with the other person. The more they talk, the more you can listen and mirror their words. This will help you navigate the conversation and drive it in the direction you want. The next technique is subtle yet highly effective, according to FBI negotiators. There's a difference between feeling emotional and feeling empathy. The latter is a game changer when in a negotiation situation. It's important to recognize emotions in the person you're negotiating with, but it's even more important that you let them know you understand their emotions. This doesn't necessarily mean you feel exactly what they feel or have felt that way before, but you can share in the emotion. FBI negotiators call this tactical empathy. The best way to do this is by using phrases like, it sounds like you're afraid of, and it looks like you're concerned about. Using this type of language tells the other person you're listening and empathizing with them. But this is a two-way street. According to FBI negotiators, it's also important for you to say what the other person might be feeling toward you before they do. For example, instead of waiting to be called selfish during a negotiation, it might be worth identifying that the other person might feel this way toward you. Saying something like, I know this sounds selfish. As long as you're careful and plan what you communicate to the other party, you won't say anything that they aren't already thinking. The best part about using empathy is that it builds a connection with the person you're negotiating with, which helps build influence. This will allow you to reach a final destination that works in your favor. Expert negotiators say it's imperative to gain the other party's trust within the first 10 seconds after negotiations begin. The best way to do this is by using tactical empathy to show that you understand the other person's challenges. FBI negotiators use tactical empathy to identify key obstacles that the other party wants to overcome. This same technique can be beneficial in any negotiation you find yourself in. 
by listening and empathizing with the other person, you'll be able to uncover what is actually standing in the way of both parties getting what they want. You can leverage that information to show how what you're asking for can even alleviate some of the stress or challenges the other person is facing. This may provide the opportunity for a mutually beneficial decision to be made. To be clear, FBI negotiators make sure to point out that there is a big difference between empathizing and sympathizing. You don't need to show you agree with the other party. This is especially true in many situations that require an FBI investigator. If you and the other person agree, then there'd be no negotiation. You also don't need to necessarily show compassion for the other person either. If someone's being rude or unreasonable, you don't need to roll over and take it, but you do need to remain calm. Empathizing with the other person and showing them that you understand their side of the argument or what they're feeling is a good way to reduce tension and allow for forward progression. This might be hard to hear, but you're going to make mistakes. Whether it happens during your normal day or during a negotiation, no one's perfect. However, FBI negotiators emphasize that making mistakes is okay and being corrected by the other party is actually what you want because it can cause them to let their guard down. Admitting our mistakes is extremely difficult. We can oftentimes get defensive even when we know we're wrong. This problem can be exacerbated in a negotiation situation unless you use your mistakes to your advantage. In fact, FBI negotiators will often intentionally make minor mistakes, so the other person will point them out, and the negotiator can admit that they were wrong. This tends to put the other party at ease, which allows for a more productive conversation. FBI negotiators explain that the reason making mistakes works in these situations is because the other side can actually feel enjoyment from pointing out your error. This causes them to want to continue talking to you and let their guard down. Being at ease also tends to force people to feel like they're collaborating instead of arguing, which means they might be more willing to listen to what you have to say as well. All of these positives come from just admitting a mistake you made. There's also a more sneaky side to this technique. By purposefully mentioning a challenge that the other person is not currently facing, they'll stop arguing to correct you. When this happens, they may also reveal information that you can leverage. In a situation where you plan on intentionally making a mistake, you need to calculate your cost-to-benefit ratio. You don't want to annoy the other person or sound incompetent by making a lot of false assumptions, but if you make a mistake, either by choice or accident, it's almost inevitable that it will help lower the guard of the other person and cause them to open up and divulge more information than they would have initially. It may also be helpful to examine this technique in a real-life situation. If you're asking your boss for a raise and they keep refusing, you might make the intentional mistake of saying, it's okay that you can't increase my salary by much since the company didn't make as much profit as we expected this year. If you know this information to be false, it could trick your boss into correcting you by saying the company actually exceeded profit expectations. At this point, you can then leverage that information your boss just put on the table in order to explain your role in helping make that profit, and therefore as a justification for getting a raise. FBI negotiators warned that accepting your mistakes is one of the tougher techniques to master. It's not something that comes naturally, as we don't normally like being wrong, and chances are in a negotiation situation your mistakes will not be planned but will happen by accident. Some negotiators even suggest practicing this skill by using deductive reasoning to analyze different situations you're in. Sometimes you'll be right, other times you'll be wrong. When you're wrong, practice accepting that fact, especially when someone corrects you. It'll be hard at first, but with time, you'll be able to easily accept being corrected, which will help in future negotiations. This next tactic might sound wrong to you, but according to FBI negotiators, there is one word you actually want to hear. That word is no. How can this be true, you might ask? It all has to do with the word yes being counterproductive. The problem with asking questions or giving ultimatums that someone has to say yes to is that it can push them too hard. This can cause them to close off from the conversation. Regardless of if you're right or not, getting someone to concede to you before the actual end of a negotiation can hurt your chances of winning. This is because people normally feel like there's a catch if they need to say yes to something during the negotiation process. In order to get around this problem, you can try framing questions in a way that no is the answer you want. A good example of this is instead of asking someone, will you do this, ask, do you have a problem with doing this? The answer you're looking for is different for both questions, but the outcome you want is the same. The person being asked these questions during a negotiation is much more likely to give you the no answer than the yes answer, even if it ends up getting them to do the same thing. Also, allowing the other side to say no gives them a sense of power and control. To them, it feels like they aren't conceding anything because they aren't using an affirmative. FBI negotiators use this tactic by asking, is now a bad time to talk? Obviously, the agent wants the other person to say no so they can continue the conversation. But if they asked, is this a good time to talk, the yes might be much harder for the other person to say. Often, FBI negotiators use this technique to show that the requests they're asking for are not unreasonable. 
This can also be done in everyday life. If you want someone to clean up after themselves rather than asking, can you please stop making a mess, you could ask, would you mind picking up your things after you're done? They're much more likely to give you the answer you want in the second question because they feel like they still have power in the conversation. FBI negotiators also have another technique they use in conjunction with asking no questions. There is a special tool in their arsenals that can redirect a conversation in a way that tricks the other party into agreeing to the negotiator's terms. There are two simple words that every FBI negotiator loves to hear. That's right. There are a few reasons for this, but the main one is that the words that's right are a cue to the negotiator that they're moving in the correct direction. It means they understood what the other party was saying, and now they can use other means to get them to do what they want. But there is another more powerful reason why that's right is so important to hear during a negotiation. You should always keep an eye out for those words because it means that the other person feels understood. This is connected to the empathy tactic mentioned before. The more the other person believes that you understand what they're saying or how they feel, the better chances of building some kind of bond or relationship with them. And the crazy part is that when someone says, that's right, it likely means they're starting to let their guard down. This building of trust, no matter how small, is a huge win in any negotiation. One of the easiest ways to get someone to the stage in the discussion where they'll use those magic words is by reaffirming that you hear what they're saying. This can be done through the mirroring technique discussed earlier, but a more powerful way to get them to this point is by summarizing their perspective, saying something like, I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying, and then restating their ideas might be enough. However, as we mentioned earlier, you're going to make mistakes. This summarization stage is a perfect place to find holes in your understanding, apologize for being wrong, and empathize with the other person. This will all gain you more favor and rapport with the other party, while also clarifying anything that you might have missed. Once you're both on the same page, the words, that's right, will likely be spoken. And then you know the negotiation is heading in the right direction. It's important to note that just because you're repeating what someone is saying to show you're listening does not mean you agree with the other person. Saying I agree with you can be counterproductive to your side of the argument, and that could prevent you from ending up where you want. By working toward the that's right statement, all you're doing is clearing up misconceptions and breaking down barriers. When you reach this point, it's important to remember the exact facts that got you to the that's right in the first place. This is because if you need to gain trust back later on, you can bring it up again. For example, you discover that someone is overwhelmed because they have too much on their plate and they make that known to you. Don't be afraid to circle back to that fact when you need to refocus the conversation. If your negotiation tactics go sideways and the other party starts to get disgruntled, remind them that you heard how overwhelmed they were and understand how stressful it can be. This will slow things down and allow the other person to vent some more. As they talk, you'll gain even more insight and be able to steer the conversation in the right direction. And here's a pro tip from the FBI negotiators. If you feel like you haven't empathized with the other party or gotten a that's right in a while, you're not laying it on thick enough. During a negotiation, someone really needs to know that you're listening to them and that you understand where they're coming from. If you don't feel like you've done enough to show you're listening to the other party, then you have it. It's time to reevaluate and make sure you mirror their speech. Tell them that you hear what they're saying and heavily lay on the empathy. Otherwise, you are quickly going to lose any of the ground you already gained. The phrase, that's right, is a good indicator that your negotiation tactics are going in the right direction. FBI negotiators can't stress enough how important it is for the opposite party to feel heard. If you're given the opportunity, it isn't a bad idea to write down key points to come back to if needed. For example, if you're negotiating with someone over the phone, it might be worth jotting down notes on a pad for future reference. A perfect example of this comes from a hostage situation in the Philippines where an FBI negotiator was brought in as a consultant. The kidnapper was holding a hostage and wanted $10 million to secure her release. The hostage taker maintained that war damages needed to be paid from over a hundred years ago. The negotiator in the situation was coached by the FBI agents who told him to write down all of the grievances and repeat them back to the kidnapper. After doing so, the kidnapper stopped asking for the money as he knew the negotiator had hurt him. Eventually, the hostage was released and brought to safety. The power of repeating what the other party is saying while in a negotiation cannot be overstated. It's a key component of every FBI negotiator's arsenal. They don't agree to the terms or demands, but they do listen to what the other party has to say and make sure they know they've been hurt. A more obvious negotiation tactic that you oftentimes see in the movies is when a negotiator allows the other party to believe they have control in a situation. The great part is that if you use the techniques discussed in this video, you can actually create this illusion. According to FBI negotiators, you should never try to force the opposite party to admit they were wrong and that you're right. In any type of negotiation, this will never get you anywhere. 
However, there is one trick that can allow you to tire out the other party and give you the upper hand. By causing mental fatigue in whoever you're negotiating with, you'll provide yourself with more opportunities to maneuver the conversation in the direction you want. You can tire out the other party by asking them how or what questions. Then all you have to do is sit back and listen to their response. The more the other person talks, the more patient you are during a negotiation, the more likely you'll find an opportunity to gain an advantage. The harder you make the other person work in the negotiation by letting them speak more frequently, the more you'll learn about them and their situation. This will allow you to leverage their emotions later on. Which brings us to this next technique you can use in your life when negotiating with someone. As you listen to the other person, take note of the different emotions that arise. If you can find something that triggers a positive emotion, hold on to it. FBI negotiators are always on the lookout for ways to magnify positive emotions to help put the other party in a positive frame of mind. This can make them more comfortable and relaxed, making them easier to reason with. It also is important to remember that in every negotiation, even those in everyday life, both sides have strong convictions. As much as you want the negotiation to come out in your favor, the other party wants that exact same thing for themselves. It should also be said that all the tactics mentioned in this video can also be used against you. Therefore, you always need to be aware of what the other person is doing to make sure you don't get fooled by the same tricks you're implementing to win a negotiation. And this brings us to another important point, something that is much easier said than done. Regardless of the situation and how you feel you must do this, FBI negotiators deal with the worst of the worst, and even though their job is difficult and the people they deal with have made very bad choices, the negotiator needs to remain calm and keep a semblance of respect. If the opposite party feels disrespected, they could do something rash, which might have terrible consequences in the situations that the FBI deals with. Even in your own life, when you have to negotiate with bosses, friends, or even family members, you need to remember to stay as respectful as possible. This doesn't mean you have to agree with the other party or even like them, but keeping the conversation progressing forward and moving toward a solution will never happen if either party feels like the other does not respect them. FBI negotiators know that if you show respect, you will receive respect in return. This is still true even if you don't like the person you're negotiating with. The main way you can ensure that you're showing respect is by genuinely listening and hearing what the other side has to say. It's when you actually listen that you can implement all of the techniques FBI agents use in their negotiations. Respect is even more important in your day-to-day -day life, because chances are you'll need to talk to whoever you're negotiating with again at some point. If your discussion was respectful and the other party felt you empathized with them and heard them out, it will help build a relationship that will benefit you in the future. Now watch FBI vs CIA, how do they compare? Or check out This is How the FBI Will Catch You on the Dark Web.